gaming in the late 90s was defined by breaking away from linear courses out into the freedom of open three-dimensional spaces, and nobody in my opinion captured that adventurous feeling better than Insomniac Spyro the Dragon. The worlds were so fleshed out and inventive, finely tuned to offer an immersive escape without boundaries, a fact that was cemented with the Reignited Trilogy back in late 2018, which brought all of these magnificent locations into a modern era remade from the ground up. And if Spyro's older brother Crash is any indication, receiving the same treatment and finally the first new game after 12 long years of waiting, I feel like now is the perfect opportunity to give Spyro the admiration he deserves by ranking every level the franchise has to offer. Yeah, that's right. I have played every Spyro game under the sun through both pleasure and pain in order to make what is probably the largest level ranking video in the history of level ranking videos because it features an insane 188 levels ranked from worst to best. So, strap in and strap on, because this is a monumental occasion. Quickly before we get started, I've got to cover some ground rules. Just so that we're clear, eligible levels include the main worlds, all hub areas across the different lands, and speedways are also being included as they're a key aspect of the Spyro experience and deserve the spotlight just as much. However, any transitional spaces or maps that feature next to nothing, such as Nork Nexus in the original game, will not be included. As usual, dedicated tutorial locations are also ineligible, and boss fights will only be included if they take place within actual levels. So aside from Nasty Nork, who appears in a dedicated arena, all of Spyro 1's bosses will be making an appearance, while many of the others throughout the series are unfortunately not invited to this party. Given that we're also including the Legend of Spyro games, which featured countless different ports, I've determined that all of these, more or less, represent the original level themes and mechanics well enough despite hardware limitations, so let's just save a whole bunch of time and headaches by simply grouping these with their respective console versions. It's not worth trying to split the hairs on that one, trust me. I'm pulling my hair out enough already after revisiting all of them. But despite its radical shift away from the traditional Spyro format, this trilogy is such a talking point for the franchise that it would be wrong not to include it. However, there were some other Spyro games that simply do not have a place in this ranking due to conflicts from genre differences. Spyro Orange on the Game Boy Advance is disqualified for being a party-style minigame collection. Spyro Fairy Dress Up on mobile is also disqualified for the fact that this abhorrent mess even exists in the first place, and as for the Nintendo DS exclusive Shadow Legacy, I've had to make the tough call not to include it, given the fact that its top-down RPG structure is just impossible to rank consistently and fairly next to the classic levels. Which is a shame, because some of those classic locations did actually appear in Shadow Legacy, mostly only recognisable by name. But it's just not going to fit in, I'm afraid. And besides, you really want to see me talk about this trash? Yeah, I thought not. This video is already long enough as it is. So now that all of that is out of the way, we can finally begin every Spyro level ranked. And there's only one way to kick things off. What is the absolute worst level of the entire franchise? The King Pooper Award goes to number 188. <laughs> Blink the Mole's Underground Caverns from Spyro A Hero's Tale. Oh yeah, if that music gives you a negative physical reaction, then you truly understand why this is at the absolute bottom of this ranking. 
We've been able to meet many of Purple Boy's friends over the course of this series, each offering some variety to the gameplay for better or worse. And Blink the Mole is without question the worst. Spelunking down in these dark cave systems, killing enemies and destroying dark crystals on paper seems like a nice variation on the game's structure. But ultimately, what we got here was a bland, tasteless adventure waiting around on slow-moving platforms, climbing monkey bars, and most likely backtracking to sweep the place clean. While these do appear in different locations with some slight variation, it's always the exact same thing, and man, does it destroy the pacing of this game. Some of these take a lot of time, and the worst part is, the first time you enter one of these maps is only for a secondary collectible. So you immediately have to go back in again to play the exact same thing over, just with additional shit you have to complete before finally earning a light crystal that are required to progress. What a back ass way of doing things, and it ruins what may have otherwise been a decent distraction. So for all the people questioning my decision to place this at the absolute bottom of the list, allow me to remind you. A level so disgustingly awful in a game that was otherwise decent leaves a much greater impact than all of the consistent trash found in bad games which were doomed from the start. Similarly, in another otherwise decent and well-received game, Attack of the Rhinox on Game Boy Advance, the thriving upbeat pace of this game is shattered with two more abysmal side quests, the first being Agent 9 Stealth Missions. Good God, how can I possibly describe to you how bad these levels are? Essentially, you need to sneak through a labyrinth side-scrolling stage, stealth attacking enemies, avoiding security cameras, and you'd better hope you don't get caught, because checkpoints are supremely limited. These courses tunnel on for ages and usually consume more time than the actual levels they appear in, especially when you're required to trek all the way down to the bottom and then are forced to backtrack all the way back out across atrocious platforming just to finally escape these hellholes. Other times, tube systems shoot you in all directions and force additional backtracking like Jesus Christ, why does this have to be such an effort? The other tedious disaster in this game is Sergeant Bird with his rescue missions, which require you to fly through these mazes, locate missing soldiers, and carry them back to a specific point on the map, all while shooting shit and getting shit shot at you. And there is ten of them! Every time! It takes so long, and thankfully there are teleport spots, but you cannot carry soldiers through them! So what's the point? The only saving grace is eventually discovering, most likely by complete accident that you can actually carry up to three soldiers at a time, but the cramped hallways are barely big enough to accommodate them, which results in this method being faster, but ultimately far more infuriating. Real disappointing. I understand that we can't expect the same level of quality seen in the PS1 games due to the limited hardware of the GBA, but most of this trilogy actually holds up fairly well years later. However, the Speedway levels featured in Season of Ice were just a complete laughing stock, even at the time. I mean, look at this, the absolute state of it. There is no actual core structure here, depth perception is virtually impossible, and they make your thumbs bleed. Why not opt for a side-scrolling or top-down arcade shoot-em-up style, or even an isometric perspective? These are all play styles Spyro achieved on this system, by the way, but no. Instead, we just get this nonsense. Given all four of these are simple palette swaps, we're grouping them together for simplicity's sake, because I'd hate to be the guy who has to define and rank such basic-ass levels. Thankfully for me, when it comes to ranking the less detailed portable maps, the stinkers really stand out. Time Machine Lab in Season of Ice is just hideous, so let's start there. The combination of Spyro Purple, Circuit Board Green and the Checkerboard is just an eyesore while running around, but running around is the hardest part. This is such an open plan course without any linear structure, so navigation is unthinkable, especially when a single wrong move off the edge of these 
these platforms lands you back at the start with no clue what direction you need to take in order to continue. It's a nightmare, and guess what? There are two levels like this, one after the other. Twilight Bulb Factory features the same issues with a complete lack of direction, no unique landmarks, and it's just generally exhausting to look at. They made Spyro purple to help him stand out from most backgrounds. You all know that, right? Well then what happened here? It's all purple on purple. The flickering lights off in the distance don't help either as they distract your eyes, and there are so many platforms to reach that you can barely even see off the border of your screen. The music here is a little little more tolerable, but I'm done with it. Time to move on. Alright, let's talk about The Legend of Spyro. Swapping out the family-friendly collectathon format, these games instead opted for a more edgy, serious approach because I guess that was the style at the time. With more focus on combat, meaning that all you do in this game is combat, by the time you reach the final level of a new beginning, safe to say this shit is getting old. And yet we're still forced into endless roadblocks of smashing more of the same enemies we've been killing for hours at this point. Like another 100 of them is going to make a difference against Spyro now. So this just goes on, and on, and on, and on for what feels like an eternity. Especially given the lack of much music and the bloom blinding you the entire way through. That is until you reach the gothic castle with more fighting the same enemies. Over, and over, and fucking over again. Man, what an epic finale, am I right? Fifty Shades of Grey, eat your heart out at the appearance of this failure. Finally, once we reach the top, we have a quick face-off against Cinder, the big, bad, evil dark dragon, and before long, Concurrent Skies is completed. Disaster! I should also mention the true battle against Cinder in Convexity that follows looks better and is vastly superior, but of course, we're not discussing standalone boss arenas, so unfortunately, it doesn't factor in here, leaving us with a desolate, barren void to discover. That's actually a great description for Shadow Legacy on the DS, which like I've already mentioned, we're not going to be including given its extreme shift into a different genre. However, I feel like I'd be doing an injustice for not mentioning Spyro's very few mobile games as I did for Crash Bandicoot in his Every Level Ranked, so it's only fair I shine a light on these lesser known titles. The last original mobile game of the franchise before a trilogy of Legends ports onto the platform, Spyro the Dragon as it's known is oddly a mobile version of Shadow Legacy. It features a very similar art style with the painted levels and backgrounds, and features Legacy's light and shadow world gimmick with different enemies across both. Given there are so few stages which are all the same thing, this game is only taking up a single spot on the list, but it's actually not the worst thing the franchise has to offer, believe it or not, even though it is appearing in the bottom 10. You basically you basically just run around fighting guys, rescuing dragons, and at the end of your game, you get to fight a simple boss. Really not much else to offer, but it is a curious piece of Spyro history that I just had to include. Time for another Spyro friend, this time it's Sparks in a Hero's Tale with some Star Fox S gameplay. I don't really know what else you'd call it. You basically navigate several corridors just trying to survive until the end through an onslaught of different critters. There are power-ups for your weapons such as homing missiles and grenades. Uh, this is a dragonfly we're talking about, right? What am I describing here? These environments offer no appeal with zero effort put into the art direction. Long story short, these side objectives suffer the same fate as Blink where in order to obtain the primary collectible, you need to play through the entire thing twice over. How ridiculous. A fate made even more super duper enjoyable with next to no post hit invincibility which causes you to lose all of your hits in a single burst when you find yourself stuck. Appalling. Hero's Tale could have been the best post-Insomniac game of the series had it not been held down with so many obnoxious side missions. Speaking of, number 179 is Cloudy Speedway. 
Bird takes flight for the speedway courses in this game, which I'll admit is a nice change of pace. The sharper turns of his jetpack and longer range attacks make these levels more of a breeze. But this level in particular just goes against everything a speedway should be doing. While I like the sunset terracotta that matches the main level, this place is so big, it's ginormous. You could fit all of the flight levels from the original trilogy all within this space. That's atrocious. This means that items are far too spread out, and what's worse is that you can't see shit. The draw distance here is an absolute disgrace to Spyro. You know, the series that was defined by its draw distance mechanics? So how did they screw this up so bad? This makes it next to impossible to even see certain objects as they only pop into your view when you're already slamming into them. That alone just ruins this entire map next to the generic military theme music that impacts all of the speedways in this game. And the sheer lack of any competent level structure drops this map down into the bottom 10. Well, let's just consider ourselves lucky that we survived the absolute worst in the bottom 10, so now we can start to move on to some good stuff, right? Oh no. Spyro still has many atrocities to offer us yet, and we're a long way away from seeing anything of value. So, I hope you've grabbed some snacks, because we've got quite the journey ahead of us. Just escaping the bottom 10 is first flight from a new beginning. Calling it first flight is stupid. Spyro has been flying since the first game, you idiots. But in this reimagined prequel, I guess this is the first time we get to fly anywhere. All you really need to do is barrel roll and carpet bomb your way to victory. It's kind of hilarious. Clearly this was supposed to be such a big dramatic moment, but everything is so lifeless and monotone that it's just a depressing distraction. Even though we got off the ground in the first game, it took until the final release before a long hiatus for our favourite dragon to finally take flight on a full-time basis alongside a now smaller and less evil cinder in Dawn of the Dragon. But the second to last level here is nothing but a ground and pound affair through the burned lands. This is actually an incredibly solemn map to visit after a series of narrative sacrifices and failures. Despite only featuring two colours, black and blooming lava red, seeing the scorched terrain and what little remains of the wilderness overcome by fiery lakes and waterfalls is stunning, I'll admit. And it's accompanied by a beautiful score as well. Too bad they had to go and ruin it by immediately roadblocking you at the start against some brutal waves of enemies with very scarce resources. And they do it again, and again, and again. Exploring while the enemies are silent would be cool, but there's just nothing to find beyond more goddamn enemies, and after climbing the cliffs, this short level abruptly ends with, you guessed it, one final roadblock that traps you with a duo of tough enemies and no resources. It's a gameplay pattern that defines Legend of Spyro, much to my sheer disapproval. Another drab level, this time for all the wrong reasons, is the Thieves' Den from Enter the Dragonfly. A stroke of genius, I'll say, to consider developing a little backstory for one of the most iconic figures of the franchise. But putting it in this game? Of all the games to include this level in, it had to be the biggest flop of the franchise. Oh, now I'm really getting upset. As a kid, I actually loved this map, so yeah, I'm surprised it took them so many years to diagnose my autism, because this is fucking atrocious! It's so big and so void of any life whatsoever. The only remnants of existence here are the gems, which jump up and walk around, and I have to admit, neat idea for a level doused in magical themes, but even that just causes more agony in the end having to chase the bastards down. Oh, and having to wait to deflect those magic attacks is also a pain and a half. Checkpoints being few and far between doesn't help either, so another slightly miscalculated jump sends you all the way back. Fuck! I have to go through all of this again? Ah, oh, that's brutal. 
I do personally enjoy the platforming side challenge because at the end of the day, I am definitely on the spectrum. Oasis Speedway found inside of the den on the other hand isn't much better. Another desolate wasteland, far too big for its own good, and with just nothing of interest going on, it's really hard to care. Fucking abysmal, all of it. Everything just feels so unfinished, almost as if everyone just gave up, cut their losses and ran far, far away. I can't help but feel the same applies to Stormy Beach, the final hub zone in a hero's tale, given the identically shit colour palette and a total lack of anything happening here. However, the music is a total contrast and sounds like it was sharted out the exhaust of a clown car or something. What's that about? And there is just so much dead, unused space on the map. You can clearly see just vast emptiness where the team quit building the level and they didn't even fill it in with gems or anything. So why is this location even here? Just start me at the volcano climb because there is nothing of value on Stormy Beach. Not even the turret minigame, but especially not the turret minigame. Oh, my brain hurts. After climbing the volcano, you eventually dive deep down inside to Magma Falls. The interior tunnels offer some crowded platforming briefly before Spyro is launched down a rail system inside of this blue ball while jumping pits and avoiding everything on the track. Wow, this segment, let me tell you. Obligatory minecart stage is just the worst because your speed and jumps are wildly sensitive and objects just flash into vision before killing you and sending you back. This brain rotting gameplay is honestly hilarious to actually play through because it's just so janky and balked and other adjectives used to describe awful Spyro stages. But I'm not laughing anymore. It's just trial and error until you eventually break through into another brief tunnel featuring more of that same claustrophobic gameplay, and then you progress into the Dark Mine. This location introduces more machinery into the already tight hallway spaces with lots of platforming gameplay. There is one part where you need to use the ice breath to create poles to vault from, but because this game was rushed and depth perception isn't the greatest, it really cripples this entire end gauntlet. What is good is that when everything does work, the entire location is incredibly brief, so you won't be stuck trudging through the ultra generic clumsy map for very long. Ugh. Up next is Ancient Grove from Eternal Night. This is just a huge, drawn-out disaster. Eternal Night is an accurate title given this game is so goddamn dark and void of colour through most of its stages, with the only contrast being the purple water all through this swamp that melts your eyes out of your face. There is little to no music, so you're just wandering around to the sound of your own footsteps while fighting armies and armies of these dog pirates. There is is, however, at least one memorable landmark to be found here. Platforming through the tall trees while gliding across the giant flying jellyfish. Hey, I said it was memorable. I didn't say it was good. Especially when they bloom and god damn it, then you're forced to fight ten strong identical enemies in a row and it's torture to my soul. I've got nothing good to say. The fight against the giant tree dude at the end is also just as mindless as everything else present here and I would be glad that it's over if Felmuth Arena wasn't the next level we have to visit. After all of that effort, the duo is ultimately captured by the pirate gang and forced to compete in their arena challenges. The only way you even stand a chance at some of these is by freezing time so you can land extra hits and just playing it safe mostly. The pirate ship battle though is oddly familiar. Maybe because it's literally a clone of a boss fight from a new beginning and we even use the same exact patterns and methods to destroy it. Pitiful. Once all of that is finally over, it's back to more linear beat-em-up stuff with the occasional roadblock puzzles that just... Uh, strange. It was easier stumbling into the secret collectible than it was just progressing through here. Why? 
The pirate aesthetic, while done to death in gaming, isn't the worst thing, and I do like breaking free to the exterior as we work our way through to Scab. This dumb dog has some really annoying attacks, and we've got next to no room to fight the guy. It's a relentless onslaught of avoiding shots that flood the screen, while accurately stepping in to take a few jabs. But it's such a difficulty spike, and at the end of one of the longest stages in the game, no thanks. Our introduction to this trilogy takes place in the swamp, with Spyro and David Spade harmlessly roaming around doing a bit of weed whacking. Mostly just mindless fodder to teach us the basic combat mechanics, there is no threat here. Only the threat of David Spade's skin crawling tones seeping through your ears the entire way through. It's just not a good first impression. The basic structure, boring gameplay, and... Just look at it! How did they manage to pick the most diarrhea and vomit inducing colours known to man? It looks like shit, and what a perfect summaration of this game, because New Beginning slurps ass through a silly straw. It may not be a good first impression, but it is scarily accurate. We're back to enter the Dragonfly now with Jurassic Jungle, the final level of the game. And no, they did not save the best for last. Without debate, the largest scale map present, it stretches on for miles. Myself or literally anyone could speed run this entire game quicker than it takes to even reach the first actual part of the map, which is this huge temple interior. Big, boring, and by god is it bad. I mean the entire level, by the way. Look at how empty this is! Why make such a gargantuan map and do literally nothing with it? It's absurd! Crossing over dodgy bridges and making awkward flights, and then once you make it inside, we're just running around on the lava and Spyro doesn't even look like he's invincible. This is just so unfinished it hurts. The tower climb side objective sucks and the volcano slide isn't much better, although at least the music absolutely slaps. But beyond simply describing how lacklustre this is, the only way to truly understand is to play it for yourself. And I fucking dare you. Back with Attack of the Rhinox and another Thieves inspired level. The Guild is, I guess, supposed to be some kind of odd school or training grounds for the Egg Thieves, which is definitely not convoluted at all. I guess the idea kind of works, but the level itself is in its entirety two courtyards with some buttons and a race in another area. That's it. The entire thing lacks imagination and just leaves no impression whatsoever. Hummingbird Fort from Season of Ice leaves an impression, but for all of the wrong reasons. Look at this level. Hmm, I wonder why this one is so low on the list. It couldn't have anything to do with the colour green, or these horrific patterns on the background, and that it all just blends together into soup and makes my eyes hurt. This is one of those GBA levels that just fails in depth perception, as all of the platforms are at different heights with no discernible way to tell if you can make your jumps or not. And it's Season of Ice, so you go all the way back to the starting point every time you fail. Not to mention these annoying off-screen enemies that fire homing missiles at you with godlike accuracy. How the hell is that fair? Looking at this legit strains my mind, so please, let's just move on to the next spot. For 165, let's quickly discuss the fairy homeworlds in Season of Ice. Since we're including the hub locations across all of the games, these have their rightful place on the list. But given the generic nature, we're just going to lump them all together given they're ultimately palette swaps with no great detail placed on the layout of each area. For the GBA, they're fine if a little unnecessary if I'm being honest, but still a nice place to catch your breath. Season of Flame is much of the same, but at least the different celestial theme locations actually featured some hidden areas to explore, along with slightly improved challenges for extra collectibles. They may serve as a stock standard hub between levels, but it's nice to get that authentic Spyro feeling on a portable device. But if you really want Spyro on the move, then maybe consider getting your hands on Spyro Ripto's Quest, which is a J2ME game for your retro, archaic mobile phone. 
Yes, the only other Spyro game on mobile eligible for the list. It's no Crash of the Titans or Mutant Island, but this little number still made a decent effort to port the experience onto such primitive technology in late 2004. We scan the different lands of ice, fire, grass, and snake to recover machine parts for the professor who only exists by name while collecting all of the gems along the way. The different areas are merely alternate colours, so it's nothing to write home about, but for the time, it was... okay, I guess. The final machine part is purchased from Moneybags, who looks like a deflated balloon, and Ripto is suddenly spooked off via text. How can they call this Ripto's quest if we don't even see Ripto? Man, that's such a letdown. Luckily for us, we do actually get to see a Ripto boss fight appear in the rankings as the grand finale of Attack of the Rhinox in Chateau Ripto. Much like Thieves Guild we saw a moment ago, there really isn't much to break down here. A few simple hallways and a grand open entrance. I would have loved to see the little fella's home represented in a more traditional, fully 3D Spyro game, but I guess this is all we get for now. The battle at the end is incredibly basic and poses no real threat, as all we need to do is use our different breath abilities to knock him off of the little podium before Butler, the professor's mechanical bear, breaks in and hugs him to death. Aww, how cute. It's a real shame that's all we're gonna see of Ripto in these rankings, given he's the series' most prominent villain. But, spoiler alert, he is supposed to be dead after the second game after all, so what do you expect? Once defeated and collecting all of the orbs, Spyro is finally free to go on holiday to Dragon Shores. Of all the secret bonus levels in the franchise, this one is undoubtedly the weakest, offering little more than childish, light-hearted easter eggs and mini-games, featuring some of the characters we met throughout the course of our adventure. Dunking people into a tank of water, shooting galleries, and even a tunnel of love that depicts brother-sister, human animal, and even adult child relations what the fuck Spyro but the real winner here is the roller coaster which is just more trouble with the trolley and far less memorable all to unlock a cutscene viewer and unlimited super flame it's underwhelming and not a satisfying payoff for all of the work it took to get here the later stages of eternal night are the point this game reaches its absolute peak which isn't saying much. White Isle is the mysterious temple Spyro is searching for throughout the game in the hopes to meet the Chronicler, a mysterious dragon who can help to track down Gaul, the main villain of this game. But in order to meet him, we first need to travel through the celestial caves of each elemental breath. So... This is completely pointless, right? Every level prior, Spyro faints and drifts off to some tutorial stages where he learns all of these different abilities, including right before arriving to this place. So why do we have to go through these trials a second time just to meet the Chronicler? It's entirely padding just to draw out the runtime on this shit show. So you work through each cave, fighting the same damn enemies and doing the same puzzles to fight the exact same elemental spirit at the end four times. Man, isn't this fun? There is no strategy. Just hit him until he stops blocking, land some hits and repeat. Then finally when it's all said and done, we have to fight the elemental dragon. And it's Cinder. Legit just evil Cinder from the first game, copy and paste it over. TAKE A BULLET! Finally, we arrive at the Well of Souls, which is the final stage, and on the outside, it's very pretty. I love the green and purple tones with the snow falling, but it quickly becomes yet another tireless onslaught through 10,000 of the same monkey enemies. There is a weird waterfall section where the platforms seem forever out of sync to make the climb, and once you go inside the mountain, you're met with some impossibly dark rooms and a gauntlet of the toughest, most cheap asshole creatures with no health resources. This shit takes ages, and if you somehow manage to defeat them all without putting a hole through your TV screen, we get to meet face to face with Gaul. This bastard is the only reason Well of Souls didn't appear any lower, as it's actually not the worst fight ever. But he does take away all of our breath abilities, meaning that all that fucking elemental training was completely worthless. Gee, thanks. 
And so all we can do is just avoid his devastating attacks until Spyro turns into Dark Spyro and blasts the monkey into burnt toast with his powerful laser attacks. A surprisingly generic yet enjoyable ending to an otherwise stinker. It never fails to amaze me how such a prominent icon such as Spyro could nosedive and spiral into such a disastrously bland experience that is the Legend of Spyro trilogy. I mean, we're only 30 levels in, and already, two of the three games are only just hanging on by a thread. So... Let's see how long they can last as we start to introduce more of Insomniac's Spyro Masterclass. Well, as much as we all love and appreciate the PS1 games, Sergeant Bird's base from Year of the Dragon is far, far from a masterclass in game design. So they introduce all these new playable characters at this point, and yet despite Bird being a flying character, they go and plonk him into a cagey, narrow hallway interior? Are you insane? It just cannot work, I'm afraid. Awkwardly flying around the place, picking up objects and searching high and low is pure garbage, even if the controls aren't the worst thing imaginable. And it's a map I feel like many will agree really brings down the experience of the third game. The music is okay once it kicks in, but this shit takes so long, get used to hearing ba ba da ba 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 da ba 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 I do like that we start inside of this glass building and then ultimately make our way outside into a more vertical space, but that's only before getting shoved back underground. Bird, who is an otherwise stereotypical cliché, but still enjoyable character to witness, deserves so much better than this, and they always fail to make his inclusions feel worthwhile. Jumping through a portal from the professor's lab into Rhinox and Clocks, this is the final level of the game prior to Ripto's Chateau. Clearly they've tried to do the whole Salvador Dali thing with the melting clocks everywhere, but this is a portable game, so that's really all we get beyond the grassy plateaus and cliff sides. Incredibly basic, that only adds to the weak finale on this one. Back outside in the lab is not much better at all, with incredibly limited structure and not much of no. The room towards the back features a huge pool to navigate and a series of puzzles to free a young dragon. This is also where we find the X-ray goggles that initiates a new goal very late into the game, scanning each environment for footprints into a secret virtual treasure room. And speaking of treasure room, now seems like no better time to discuss number 155, Nasty's Loot. This is our first entry from the first game in the franchise, and was there ever any doubt that this would be our introduction to it in the rankings? After defeating Nasty Nork and rescuing all of the dragons, Spyro gets to fly around collecting gems, and it's really, really boring. Yeah, not much to this one. The thing that always flusters me is the weird height restrictions. Spyro finally has free flight, but how free you actually are is determined by which doors you've opened and which ledges you jump from. It's just uncomfortable, and with the only thing of note being a plane chase and some fireworks, the final room where we find all of that precious booty isn't enough to carry this stage any further. Alright, I think it's time we blast through a heap of these GBA levels, because as fun as the games are, there just isn't a whole lot going on to really compare or rank. So let's clear the way, starting off with Honey Marsh in Season of Ice, the third official Honey-themed Spyro level, for some reason. The primary piss off here is just the enemies. Big bees throwing smaller bees. Wow, how creative. It's just annoying to navigate at the end of the day, but the music is pretty at least. It just doesn't have anything else to offer. Star Park is much of the same, featuring more of a cloud theme than a space one, where trying to figure out where the hell to go is a challenge as usual. There are just no defining landmarks, and it all quickly blurs into a mushy paste. The goal here is running around collecting Wi-Fi signals, and I'm glad there are no annoying enemies, but this one is ultimately void of any action, so moving on. 
Season of Flame generally featured some better levels simply because they included checkpoints and more defined missions, but Moon Fondue is just a hideous green vomit mess with admittedly more chill music that these games are well known for. But it's hard to chill while you're waiting around on platforms with a clock up your ass. You won't survive without the electric breath and the mountains and towers towards the back are kind of annoying, especially this tedious zigzag shit. My goodness. Next up is Winter Mesa, a Christmas level. You don't see snow levels this specific too often, and there is a reason why. Cause it just comes across super basic, and what sort of missions can Spyro possibly complete here? Lighting candles? GBA ice hockey? Oh god. And let's not forget a fucking escort mission with this alpaca prick. Who thought this was a good idea? God forbid you try to get ahead to clear the path, as he just absolutely sharts himself and goes back to the starting point. Ugh, are you kidding me? Dreamy Castle is very similar to Moon Fondue, featuring a lot of platforms to wait around on, but this time also some more open spaces too. The little balloonist guy we help out is cute, and I would enjoy this platform race if it didn't include annoying enemies that freeze you constantly. But when that's all you've got to see, what else can I possibly discuss? Same case for Gypsy Road, which recycles many of the same magic assets seen in other levels like the previous spot. The core the design here is very basic, without a lot of flair, but the level at least presents well with nice, cooler visuals and more wondrous music. My only grievance is the side challenge where you need to chase these little fire freaks around and freeze them all at once. Absolute garbage side quest, and the only point of interest for this stage. I wish there was more to say on these, because none of it is necessarily atrocious or anything, it's all just limited and quite uninspired. The same can be said for Enter the Dragonfly's Rainbow Speedway. Limited and uninspired, and what the hell is going on here? It's your stock standard speedway affair, but with a terrible frame rate due to all of the vast nothing clogging up the processor while it's trying to render all of these cloud physics. Though I will say that the music here is kind of lovely, it drones over the racing and makes me dissociate. There's just not a lot going on. Midday Gardens, the second homeworld from Year of the Dragon, is another very limited space that makes no attempt to stand out from any of the other grassy knolls found in the series. The entrances of each level overflow with some character, but aside from the Egg Thief and a Super Flame challenge, there is just nothing to discuss here. A real disappointment for an original trilogy contender. Spyro's adventure through Attack of the Rhinox actually presents us with a very decent homeworld with a more extended look at Dragon Shores. Split across a few different regions, we explore shorelines, sandy islands, and grass-covered hillsides, along with the stormy passage where we encounter a quick battle against Butler, which opens up the hidden cave to the Thieves' Guild. The caves in this game are to die for, with some of the best music of the entire franchise, in my opinion. We also bump into Ripto later on in the game with another boss fight that's actually tougher than the one at the end inside of his chateau. It may be a simple hub location on a portable device, but system limitations didn't entirely hold this one back. A solid effort. 145 is more Agent 9 on Game Boy Advance. Oh no. Thankfully, Season of Flame actually got Agent 9 correct with some simple side-scrolling shooter levels, which is shocking given that they completely ruined this for the next game with that heinous stealth BS. But no, the running and gunning here is passable. We've got different weapon attacks and a variety of stages, all incredibly simple, hence why they're grouped together. The only real piss off is the limited camera control and tedious platforming to be found here, but otherwise, this is about what you'd expect for a distraction in a portable title. Next is a level that, in my opinion, completely failed to recognise what made the Spyro formula so enjoyable. Crop Circle Country is where I'd wager a bet most turned off Enter the Dragonfly and never played it again. 
This wide open expanse, shrouded in game-breaking fog and vast space with no purpose, goes against everything we loved about the PS1 trilogy. The farm being invaded by Aliens theme is such a tired cliché, and the UFO challenges? Oh dear. The platform climb is okay, but the other one where you have to fly around preventing cows getting beamed up and probed, all while taking out golden UFOs, it shits for the birds. What is it with Hunter and UFOs? Who thought that needed to be a story that spanned multiple games? One game is too many. But no, they took Country Speedway from Spyro 3, farmer designs and all, fogged it out with muddy visuals and just slapped this awkward course together with no rhyme or reason. No thanks. Another long, dreary and dark level is the Night Temple, which opened up Eternal Night. Go figure. It's a bland romp through hordes and hordes of Gaul's minions, but the absolute state of it. Everything is blue for Christ's sake. That's not how you make a night level. The interior caves and such are also just uninspired and it's an incredibly drawn out, flat start to the game. However, for those familiar with the DS version of the game, the Night Temple here does actually present much nicer in certain areas, with an additional library interior to explore, and a beautiful garden that, wouldn't you know it, isn't fucking blue! Worth a mention, I guess, but severely lacking in the gameplay department, so... Uh, whatever. Dante's Freezer in A New Beginning is another long slog through waves of enemies, who would have guessed? But at least there is some slight variety to their designs. I really like the floating skeleton dudes personally. Launching snowballs out of catapults is a common theme here too, but that's about it. The tree-lined valleys and decrepit fortress structures make for some neat visuals, but the Ice King we have to fight in the end leaves so much more to be desired. Honourable mention to the DS version of this game for its Crash Bandicoot easter egg, and a dishonourable mention to the GBA version for making the Ice King take 9 million hits to destroy. Damn. And just like that, it's time to eliminate our first game from the ranking. Following Felmuth Arena in Eternal Night and that annoying fight against Scab, he escapes anyway, so Spyro has to chase him down across the pirate fleet. Gliding from one ship to the next, exploring inside and out, and absolutely murdering every single living creature. It is a cool set piece, but not for the 40 minutes it takes to painfully work through all of this nonsense. Cause and effect in these games is always quite a peculiar sight that is no more apparent than in this level. Fighting pirates allows you down inside of the hull to fight more people, and once they're defeated, a nice friendly little boat arrives to take you to the next area. Don't question it, just get on, shut up and enjoy the pretty sunset, which is actually not half bad by Spyro standards. Finally, we arrive at our rematch with no strategy, no resources and all of the familiar cheap attacks. If this mediocrity is the peak of Eternal Night, then there is no doubt in my mind that this is one of the absolute worst games in Spyro's history. So I'm glad to finally wash my hands of this stink. Full completion of Spyro 3 grants you access to the super boring round, running around doing more of the tedious busy work the game was known for. Chasing thieves for a cash in of gems is satisfying enough, but it quickly devolves into doing more of the awful submarine combat and the rocket board race which I'm sure you're all familiar with. The vehicles in 3 garnered mixed opinions. I'm personally on the no thanks I'll pass side of the coin, but I will admit this does give it that epic secret level feel. Plus the world itself looks really nice and features a great soundtrack. Reignited didn't execute it quite as well with all of the gross crystal mountains everywhere, and the final, final showdown against the sorceress is incredibly underwhelming no matter which version you're playing. Definitely the strongest bonus level of the original trilogy, no doubt, but for all of the effort, there is hardly anything super about it. We haven't seen Hero's Tale in a little while, which is surprising, given that it kickstarted this entire ranking. 
Iceberg Aerobatics is another very generic speedway level, but unlike Cloudy Domain, this place is far too small to offer up any actual design to the placement of items, making it a tightly squeezed clusterfuck for what should be a free-flowing flight stage. Basically, it's just a poor man's icy speedway, which is probably the most forgettable speedway of Ripto's rage, so... Wow, definitely worth striving to emulate that. Canyon Speedway in 2 has more of a hallway design going on that really cuts your balls off as you scream down the tight tunnels and craters on the map. Sorry for anyone who thinks I'm mad for feeling this way, but the level is trash. Case in point, Hunter's Weird On Rails Shooter Mission. It's so bad. I can't see how anyone could defend this, and all in all, it's just a bit of a letdown so late into the game. It may seem like sacrilege to some, but I actually feel like Bonsai Speedway from Enter the Dragonfly trumps both of these, given it, at the very least, achieves that spacious feel. Of course, it's mostly unused space, but it feels more like how a flight level should feel to play, and while the graphics leave much to be desired, I'd die on the hill that the music for this area fits really well and matches other songs throughout the entire franchise. It's so genuinely chill and yet still vibrant with energy for the fast-paced racing and challenge runs. Shame that it only exists for one of the most bare-bones speedway courses. And by combining the struggles and victories of all three of these speedways, unlocks Icy Flight from the first game. It feels cramped in areas and open in others, with the tunnels that lead you through, and while entirely forgettable, its soundtrack is one of the best for the first game. Copeland, of course, always the master of memorable tunes. None more memorable, iconic, or ear-piercing than the Harbour Speedway theme for power players of Spyro 3. Because if you didn't know, it plays across all of the speedways in this game. Personally, I love it. It's a riveting and bouncy song with so many little elements layered in there to complement the flying gameplay style. As for Harbour Speedway itself, the challenge run is by far the most basic in the entire game where you simply lap the island over and over with virtually no challenge. So, I guess to make up for that, they gave the racing AI all of the supreme hacks to make this race a difficulty spike many players will never forget. Given flight levels should be hard to get wrong, the balance on this one being so out of whack really hurt its staying power on this list. Rabbit Habitat is another simple map in Attack of the Rhinox, which starts off with this poor bunny cut in half and having both of his ends stolen away. How violent! This is like a snuff-themed level, I guess. The magic aesthetic is about what you've come to expect, with these annoying moles that need exterminating from the top hats in order to jump up to certain ledges. And let me tell you, these aren't the only moles that need exterminating. There really isn't much to say on this one, for better or worse, to be honest. The important thing is that we're well beyond the unforgivable atrocities of Spyro at this point. Now we're just trying to get started on working our way through the below average levels of the series. Cheetah Spot Spa is another from the third GBA installment, but at least there is some actual effort put in here, climbing the different ledges in the back and saving all of the fitness freaks from malfunctioning gym equipment. Man, they were really stretched for a hunter-themed level, weren't they? Honestly in disbelief that it wasn't themed around cows, UFOs, or manta rays, to be honest with you. There is a side challenge, flaming Rhinox out of the sky, and I like seeing all of the buff daddy cheaters vibing to the music, but that's about all that can be said for number 133. Winter Tundra at the end of Ripto's Rage is so memorable with immaculate presentation which features a giant castle perched atop a vast mountain range. And oh my, look at that gorgeous sunset off in the distance and accompanied with that soothing ambience, it offers so much mystery to uncover with secret caves and waterfalls. What an absolute crime that it's so damn small. I'd kill to get this higher with much more expansive hub worlds of the franchise, but I'm doing my best to remain unbiased. The potential of Winter Tundra far outweighs its actual value to the series, offering so very little in the final stretch of this adventure. 
Munitions Forge from New Beginning is sadly one of the standout levels of the game with only one other level to beat it. And isn't that just sad, because look at it, it's another dark drawn out mountain area, this time coated in a wash of blistering red. Your retinas are now permanently scarred for life. You're welcome. At least this level stands out for a few reasons. I do like this section where the train track runs above and then we work our way back up along that pathway. The battle on the train cars though is so laughably terrible, my sides would be splitting if I wasn't so exhausted from playing this crap. And the final boss against the train is simply put, not good. No clear pattern and just generally boring. It's a study on psychosis that anyone would consider reskinning this battle frame for frame in the sequel's Felmuth Arena like I mentioned earlier. Disgraceful. Thankfully, the level ends with Spyro flying through the collapsing volcanoes for what I guess is a cool moment. Those are few and far between for these games. One of the key set pieces in Dawn of the Dragon is the Dragon City where an epic battle of the ages is taking place. Spyro and Cinder first need to fire fight by sourcing some fresh water and using buckets to stop a building from burning down, all while fighting off attacking foot soldiers. Afterwards they ascend the large walls that border the city and we get an epic visual of armies upon armies making their way towards us. But this is where things crawl to an endless endurance of offense and defense. Hope hopelessly repairing the single cannon we have to protect us while destroying waves and waves of enemies. There is no denying that it is a cool moment, but it chews up so much time and can be incredibly fucky if you're not paying attention. And that's only the second part. The level ends with a courtyard battle against this big lug and then fighting against the game's failure to explain what on earth you're actually supposed to do here. And given these two levels go hand in hand, after all of that pissing about, the following level is just more of the same. Roadblocked at waves and waves of enemies before climbing a tower to battle against the vicious golem. As a cooperative two player game, man this would be so much easier if the second player just didn't exist. His attacks are so annoying and given we have to climb up to even reach the guy, a single wrong move sends you way back down. Thankfully this game is kind enough to offer a few additional resources down there, but it's just mind-rotting patterns waiting to mash the buttons and he's ultimately defeated with a quick time event. What a little sissy bitch. Now granted, both of these are key features for the narrative here, but I don't care. This is the third game in a row to feature this same mindless brain-rotting combat where nothing matters and it's all made up for some asinine excuse to draw the adventure out longer than necessary. I am so sick of it. Back to Season of Flame and an incredibly uninspired level in Candy Lane. Absolute bottom of the mediocre barrel with this one, just scraping it clean. For a candy level, it's not even that sweet. We're running around pink fluffy cliffs and gliding over sewerage runoff. Or I guess it could be chocolate milk. I don't know, I can't say I'm man enough to take a gamble on that one, but yeah, it's pretty boring. The only details of note are the cake building segment, and that all of the Rhinox are dressed like wee little children, so the visual of Spyro bashing and burning them alive is something to marvel at. And the worlds of pure unimagination continue with another honey marsh. You know, if this level didn't look so soupy and the frame rate was higher than 5, I'd say this could have been a decent little Spyro level. It's more of the same bee enemies, but also banjo-wielding swamp folk and all matter of other creatures. The level music is also pretty catchy with its country bumpkin charm, but that's where it ends for this one. There are so many horrendous floaty jumps here, and others that just don't work for whatever reason. The tank segment is really, really unwelcome, and the honey slide is just depressing. When the most notable moments from a level are Spyro's head glitching and Spark saying HI, then you aren't making it any higher than 127.
Ice Citadel is another level that sounds good on paper. Nothing screams cool like a snowy fortress, but this is more like a grey maze than anything else. Why did they take that route? I will never understand. It's so grim. When you finally get out into the open courtyards and such, there is finally some decent architecture to explore before you're quickly thrusted back inside to light fires and supercharge through an acidic sewer. Because that's what every ice level needs. A goddamn sewer section. Nice one, guys. Back in the game's final chapter, Molten Mount kicks things off as we ascend from Stormy Beach across a scorched volcano. Exploring inside and out, this level presents much better in my opinion, though the actual content is still lacking. It's mostly just destroying fire baddies with your ice and water breaths, slowly knocking these big guys off of ledges, and this button challenge which is so bullshit because the game fails to explain that you're actually on a time limit here, so have fun figuring that one out. While the stage is mostly cave systems, at least it also manages to show off some expansive exterior set pieces that encourage exploration into the distance. You know, that thing Spyro is known for? Finally starting to see that here. And now what we know and love about Spyro is once again ripped right from our hands with this bastard monkey. Agent 9's lab from Year of the Dragon is always a level up for debate among fans, though I would say that many agree it's really not the strongest. The music slaps and I love the bright beach visuals, but from a gameplay perspective, it slows everything to a crawl, painfully aiming your gun and taking out stronger enemies with grenades. Thankfully, the Reignited Trilogy did improve in the control department, making things more fluent to run through, though the level itself suffered drastically, as it's much darker and muddier in appearance. So I feel like the PS1 version is superior, but regardless with which you play, it's a change of pace, but one nobody really asked for in this game, given how overflowing it is with alternate playstyles. But hey, at least it still shits all over all that stealth crap. Dreamweavers is the final homeworld of the first game before we move into facing Ganasty Ganork. The visuals are pretty and Copeland killed it on the soundtrack once again. It's just the layout that makes this one more of a chore than anything else. Given you have to constantly move around towards the cannon in the center just to make enemies vulnerable to your attacks is a bit tedious. The castle towards the back is a nice little area to navigate, but beyond that, this simple hub overstays its welcome for me. Over to the Game Boy Advance again with Sparks' levels from Season of Ice. These are a downgraded, albeit well done recreation of his mini stages from Year of the Dragon and they act as a welcome distraction for this portable title. However, given there is so little to say on these to begin with, I'll just save that for when we discuss the true Spyro 3 versions down the track. Sticking with Season of Ice though, Dusty Trails is one of the final levels in the game and it's hardly a rewarding feeling to play. I mean, it's okay, but I'm not looking for just okay. It's another difficult one to navigate and the bedtime lullaby music will put you to sleep fast. To give it a little credit though, had it been upscaled and HD-ified in 3D, then maybe it would have been Dino Mines from Spyro 3. Market Mesa is another level that I could see working beyond the limitations of this system, essentially offering a tower and courtyard with some bridges leading to nearby structures. It's very small and would be easy to navigate if it wasn't for the bare ledges and narrow walkways that make falling off of the map far too common. I do like the very relaxing tunes that play while you're here though, even if it doesn't match the anxiety inducing egg thief chase that is no doubt one of the hardest things you'll ever achieve in the entire game. Now it's time for the first appearance of a boss from the original game, Dr. Shemp in Peacekeepers. We're introduced to the level with this magnificent skybox and a rocking tune as the big mummers who inhabit the land send these little blokes on a suicide mission in our direction. It doesn't take very long at all to see everything here and move inside to the actual battle which is sadly just as underwhelming as the level itself as the good doctor flails around without much success. Just toast his bum a bit and that's it. One of the most memorable characters of the game extinct within the blink of an eye. 
Time for more mundane speedways. Lava Palava is not as cramped as the ice level we saw earlier, but the placement of items isn't much better, and the actual design of the terrain leaves much to be desired. Thank god it offers no challenge whatsoever, because we need to start making serious tracks through this list. It might be kind of mean to put some classic speedways so close to the watered down efforts we saw in later games, but Night Flight at the end of the day is a very basic course. So basic in fact that it shares some scary similarities with Crystal Flight seen in the following world. Both of these are next to identical, with Crystal Flight having a slightly less annoying layout, while Night Flight had the better music, even if both of the songs for each level were incredibly well put together. Both of these finally reach their true potential with the updated visuals in Reignited. Shame that it's all they really have to offer. Now it's time to discuss Jacques. This jack-in-the-box joker is pathetic, but thankfully, there is something of a unique course ahead of him. With split paths, the level can be approached in a few different orders, which helps it stand out against the other linear levels. Well, that would be the case if its biggest detractor wasn't a dead end towards the back that enforces backtracking through the otherwise underwhelming environment. The annoyances of these little timer dudes on top of that, and let's not forget, worthless shit cunt here who ranks up as possibly the biggest pissant boss in all of video game history, then it shouldn't be a shock to see this map ranked so low. Moving on to the sequel now with Shady Oasis, and what a disappointing level I think most, myself included, often forget even exists tucked away in the back of Autumn Plains. Scorch Light forces us through an incredibly dull hallway, escorting this bulbous inflating hippo along the way to break down the gates. It's fine the first time through, but having to go all the way back on a hunt for these mysterious vases is not fun, and that's accentuated even further by having to chase down the thieves as well, though at least they do introduce some energy into this otherwise non-impactful level. But the cherry on top is the forced backtracking again once you've obtained the head bash ability for all of a 30 second mini game and you're done. Moving on. Let's instead discuss another level brimming with potential in my opinion that may never get the opportunity due to its inclusion in Attack of the Rhinox. Moneybags has secret treasure vaults hidden all across the lands in this game, so it comes as a welcome surprise when we actually get to visit his humble abode. Laced with security measures and overflowing with golden coins and bars, loose cash and treasure, it's kind of neat to see where all of Spyro's spare change ended up after all of his adventures. The the level itself is again very basic, but I absolutely love the detail of these little cats that you need to dizzy and direct onto the buttons so you can progress through the level. I would kill to see this fully realised one day, but for now, this is our only glimpse into the reality of money bags. Well, unless you count Bear Forest from Shadow Legacy on the DS, where he's started a family of melted faced children out in the middle of the woods. But no, we don't count that here, so let's move on because we're quickly creeping up on the halfway mark. The home worlds in A Hero's Tale generally did quite a good job of just offering a large, open-ended space for you to explore and track down the various collectibles and challenges hidden throughout. The problem with Frostbite Village is that it tends to fail in the actual reward part of that deal. Different areas stretch on for eternities, and with unique landmarks few and far between, it's very easy to get lost in this mess of blue polygons. There is a cave beneath a sheet of ice which is cool, and various frosted caves to destroy discover, but that's it really. Of course, I'm choosing not to mention the brain melting turret defense missions because I just can't handle even thinking about it. So let's move on to number triple one. Monkey Monastery. Another wide expanse of icy wilderness with no discernible landmarks, and yeah, it's got all of the same problems as Frostbite Village. It takes so long to get anywhere or make progress, and the entire level is held back by atrocious frame rates. When enemies step onto the ice, their reflections tank the entire game as if it wasn't appalling enough already. If it weren't for the calming atmosphere and an okay slide to conquer, 
this may have appeared much lower. But then, looking at this cannon shit, I'm starting to wonder if it even deserves this spot so high up. They fucked up the Yetis from Spyro 3, they fucked up the ice physics, there are definitely worse levels out there, but damn, there is also so much better that we're yet to encounter. Monkey Monastery is tucked away to the back of the Dragon Realms, and I've got to say, I kind of like what they've got going on here. Yes, it's very dead as there is no life and each of the levels flooding out of their entranceways is the only interesting detail, but this was the first time we saw a Spyro game where all of the levels were accessible from a single location. Had it been fleshed out by a stronger development team, I see this working well for the formula. Not to mention that really chill music that is about as close as this game gets to sounding like a classic title in the franchise. I wish there was a lot more to this one. I really do. Beast Makers from the first game, on the other hand, is another solid homeworld, somehow managing to make a swamp look thoroughly appealing. And the stark mechanical influence Metalhead's troops have had over the otherwise natural landscape creates for some startling visuals. My earliest memories of this game were glimpses of the small huts and the well you can jump down into. Plus, I've always loved climbing the large pyramid structure to get a good look at the environment. A decent hub world that I feel not too many appreciate. Back in A Hero's Tale, after all of the doom and gloom in the final stages of the game, we finally arrive to Red's Laboratory, and it's just occurred to me that, unlike the older Brother franchise, which was constantly ripe with sci-fi, tech-enthusiastic lairs, Spyro, on the other hand, never really saw too many of these. And it's any wonder, given that it generally doesn't fit within the series' core fundamentals. Choreographed as a series of linear hallways filled with base Basic, yet often poorly constructed hazards and unenthusiastic enemies, as well as unenthusiastic players, this hunt for the remaining Dark Crystals is a slog so late into the game as you're forced to backtrack out of each area into the central door chamber. Once it's all said and done, we move into battle against Mecha Red, which is where this level peaks, thank God. The previous battle against regular old plain ass Red was a clumsy spike in difficulty, so it's nice to end off with a more balanced showdown and a drumming tune to set the mood. Alright, time to knock out another game from the ranking with Tall Plains from a new beginning. Unfortunately, the best this game has to offer is a somewhat stark jaunt through a grassy wilderness solving basic puzzles, navigating deep inside cave walls avoiding traps, and across rope bridges to nowhere. While kinda basic, I can appreciate the atmosphere brought in by the fog surrounding these stone pillars and the mountains the level take place above, combined with those chilling flutes and tribal tones. But it also happens to include this awful ship segment, which goes on for ages and chokes this level of enjoyment given the spike in challenge Spyro is faced with here, fighting wave after wave of increasingly tougher foes. Finally, the battle against the Sentinel is blind, dumb button mashing. A predictable end to yet another Legends title eliminated in the bottom half of this list. Of all the playable characters introduced to the series in Year of the Dragon, Sparks the Dragonfly is one that most maybe wouldn't expect to have seen. These little side areas see Golden Boy here fluttering around blasting insects and other creepy crawlies because he's got a bazooka for a face apparently. Ah, whatever, it's a decent distraction. From Crawdad Farm through Spider Town, Starfish Reef and the Bugbot Factory, this quadrilogy are all incredibly similar, so we're just grouping them up for this spot, much like Season of Ice's bootleg versions on the GBA we glanced at just a moment ago. These are honestly all fine, just a mere change of pace at the end of the day, one that maybe seems a little tacked on to this adventure, and admittedly, hasn't aged too well on the replay factor after all of these years. Years. Bird Barracks in Spyro's third Game Boy Adventure is one of the much more noteworthy and memorable locations of the game, featuring a large archipelago of frosty icebergs that await the player. You have to freeze the walrus who lives in the area and use him as a little raft across the ocean. 
Back on land, there isn't a whole lot to see, with the greater mountain base and then a much larger and isolated area, which is where we need to locate and rescue a bunch of soldiers and take them back to camp. It's a blissful little area with peaceful music, and I love the ballistic shift in tone as Spyro starts carpet bombing the entire goddamn level, like holy shit Spyro, calm down, it doesn't have to be this way, just please stop with all of the murder. This purple prick has been blood hungry ever since the first boss in the original game, known as Toasty. I'm sure you're all familiar. How did this guy garner so much love over the years? All you nostalgia junkies really stopped playing this game after the first world, didn't you? I know there isn't much character wise to really latch onto in this game, but really? This worthless bastard? Maybe I'm missing something. I will give you the rest of this level though. Structurally, there isn't much going on, but aesthetically, with the glowing skybox and bold, harsh colours, which are complemented by booms in the audio department separated by magical chimes, it's an absolute delight. Seriously, a big slapper for this stacked soundtrack. It may not be much of a level, but goddamn, it does set the scene quite well for the player to continue on their journey. Sunken Ruins is pure average with its dank hallways and forgettable puzzle areas. It's not a difficult level or even really that bad, it's just a palate cleanser. Flat. Null. A reset for your senses, which is the last thing you want entering a new hub area. The actual entrance to the level is far more iconic than the level itself, and that really just says it all, I think. Aside from some nice music and some terribly dated humour, it's a shame to see a level theme usually done quite well by other games sink so low down the ladder. Within the same part of A Hero's Tale, Cloudy Domain is another level that on paper shows a lot of promise. Floating among the misty sunset clouds soars a terracotta city, and if you stop for a moment to take in its majesty, then yeah, it's pretty neat. But now you've actually got to play the damn thing. The most obvious path leads you to something of a dead end smack bang in the middle of the map, which always throws me off when I come through here. So you backtrack beyond the obnoxious enemies to find side paths that actually lead you through more of the level we're intended to explore. Man, that's so weird. You've got these platforms which give off real Jack and Daxter vibes, and while they help to introduce unique elements into a top 10 ranking level, they merely hold this one down below the top 100 for God's sake, because it's just not interesting. There is also this atrocious ball obstacle course with inconsistent physics which just really irks me, and overall, Cloudy Domain suffers tremendously. Sticking with another sky level, Floating Islands is the final level in Dawn of the Dragon, and what an excellent set piece to finish off the game. Gliding above the world down below, we can get a good glimpse of the Dragon City, Scorched Earth, and other landmarks we've seen across our journey. It's also one of the few levels in the game where free flight is required, jumping from each different chunk of terrain, killing enemies, and lighting torches that open a door. It's whimsical in downtime, and a peak of narrative when facing combat. Inside is another roadblock of more familiar mind-numbing gameplay, which really hurts this in my opinion, especially following the slog of tedious battles in the prior level. But for a final map, it gets the job done. While not eligible for the ranking, I'd also like to add that Malifor, the final boss, while he takes place inside of his own chapter following this, it's actually one of the more dramatic and well put together fights of the entire franchise, even with the dated fads of 2008. So while we've already removed two legend titles from this list, I'm glad to see the third game is still offering something decent to the ranks. And in at number 100, we have The Dam. When a giant colossus begins wreaking havoc across the land, Spyro and Cinder plan to destroy a nearby dam to flood the valley, stopping it in its tracks. This map is incredibly vast, exploring down near the bottom of this giant wall, destroying nameless enemies. As we climb up and up, it's just more of the same. The real kicker here is that when you reach the top, it's discovered that we need some of these weights to press down switches in order to release the water. So you're forced to scale back down these treacherous climbs along vines and trying your best to jump despite the dead weight you're holding onto. Believe it or not, I was dreading revisiting this level after so long as the dam is a cause of trauma for my gamer brain. 
Thankfully, I've played this level now with a second player and I can say it's far, far less of an issue. In single player, you need to control both of these bums at once, but while playing cooperatively, you've got a bit of help and a lifeline through all of the climbing and combat. So while still somewhat tedious, it's an incredible story moment that you'll never forget. Let's keep knocking down more hero's tail with Gloomy Glacier, the first and only level of the entire series where you play exclusively as Hunter. Finally getting a chance with this guy on foot after so many games in the background, I wish he'd just stayed there. <laughs> it's fine in short bursts, but for an entire area, the slow, long-distance archery attacks and his awkward movement really doesn't do this otherwise decent environment any favours. Everything just feels very floaty, and that's the worst for navigating tight platforming sections with multiple different things all happening at once. Getting stuck fighting enemies in close quarters combat also doesn't match the gameplay style, which is just weird. The novelty factor of playing as Hunter helps it a lot in my opinion, but as that slowly wears off, this just helps you to appreciate more of the standard Spyro action after so much failed experimentation. Level 98 is Bentley's Outpost from 3, and really, what do you expect me to say about this one? I don't know, it's tolerable, but like, Bentley just doesn't have much to offer. Clod hopping around the snow just smashing shit isn't all that interesting, and the bat swing move is so incredibly situational, it barely serves any purpose whatsoever. The music is fine and the visuals are also passable, particularly the lighting in Reignited. It's quite pretty and thankfully doesn't overstay its welcome, but otherwise, it's the definition of just above mediocre. To be honest, I actually preferred Yeti Serengeti from Attack of the Rhinox, given that you A, actually get to play as Spyro, but also B, because it's far more dynamic than that other one. And this is on a weak portable system, so what's your excuse there, Insomniac? Digital Eclipse did a good job on this neighbour to Bird's Base, an icy region with lots of snow and angelic harmonic tunes. We're taken from the mountains, out onto the water once again, and through chilling caves with some of the best music this series has to offer. Incredibly Zelda-esque with the Oak Arena, and offering some interesting, memorable locations to discover. Yeti Serengeti is a sleeper hit on the GBA spectrum. Watertopia in Season of Flame, despite the weak name, is another decent level. Nothing really of note I could point out though, it's just a solid, fun course of classic Spyro action with several nice elements contributing to the relaxing theme. Switching things up a bit, however, is Sheila the Kangaroos maps, also found inside of Flame. Aside from the hilariously bootleg visual of Sheila flying through the loading screen, these isometric hoppers work well as an alternate playstyle on the go, bouncing around cliffs of various themes, stomping holes in heads, and exploring for extra treasure. Some aspects can be quite cumbersome, such as the forcibly linear structure generating a lot of backtracking and some annoying enemies in certain spots, but these are some otherwise fun little stages to mix up the game which prove that additional side characters can contribute positives when handled correctly and played to their strengths. And just like that, we have officially reached only the halfway point of this ranking? My goodness. If this was the Jack and Daxter every level ranked, we'd be home by now. Please, people, stand up and stretch your back and, you know, get your body moving. Especially if you're here for the long haul, you got to look after yourself. And if you've enjoyed the video so far, then please remember to drop a like, subscribe and share it with a friend and on social media. These big bastards are a monster task, but they're so much fun to make, so that support really goes a long way with me. Thank you very much. Okay, we've had a moment to stretch and regroup and resupply the snacks, so let's keep moving on with level number 94, Island Speedway from A Hero's Tale. Wow, what a creative name, am I right? This is what it looks like. Without question, a strong winner for the absolutely average award. Nothing to bitch about, but nothing to offer us. Moving on. <laughs> 
In similar fashion, Sunny Flight from the first game was our introduction to the Speedway formula. While it is indisputably a classic location, the limited structure and design was a humble beginning for what will go on to be a truly defining feature of the franchise as it evolved. By the time we got to Honey Speedway in Spyro 3, these levels featured much more individuality with their distinct themes, race modes that loop the entire course, which this one offers some decent challenge, and even a hidden objective with Hunter zooming down the sticky river in his boat, away from flying saucers. It's not great, I'll admit that I don't like the soundtrack for this one either. What was the fascination with Honey in this franchise? I just don't get it. But overall, a decent standard you can expect from these levels. Icy Speedway from 2 actually tried to mix things up as one of the very few flight levels with a greater focus towards the ground, which is certainly of note. But otherwise, I tend to forget this one is even in the game when I play through, and I've only been playing the game my entire life, so that says quite a lot. Not a fan of Hunter's challenge here either, they were usually always a detractor unfortunately. Moving back over to the Game Boy titles for a bit, Temple of June is one of the better levels in Season of Flame, where it just feels like a Spyro level. What else could I really say to sell this one? A decent desert theme with explorers and a catchy tune as we run around disposing of bombs and exploring for treasure. You can't really go wrong with it. Banana Savannah in Attack of the Rhinox has us using these cute little flower pads to pop us up all over the place, which can get pretty confusing, so thankfully the stage is rather small. While not much else really happens here, it's a memorable one for this game, I think. Generic, but well executed. The Fairy Library at the start is another good one with a basic layout across the different floors, lighting up the fires to warm up these little critters who transport you all over the place. There is even a quick encounter with Ripto's giant worm, which is definitely not an innuendo, and it's an overall decent addition to the game, and even offers some background to the fairies within this universe. One of the first worlds we visit back in Season of Flame is Shamrock Isle, another one that really feels like grasping at straws for any kind of original theme. Crafted from gold bars, horseshoes and clovers, this level is lucky to have made it so high up given it also contains this dreadful dash to capture pixies. God this is tough, but it's an otherwise solid opener for this game as we get ready to close another. Kangaroo Hoodoos is the final map from Attack of the Rhinox we have to discuss. The vast sprawling badlands comfort us with some very meditated flute tunes as we destroy all of the TVs broadcasting Ripto's propaganda and solving puzzles. Despite Attack of the Rhinox being the superior GBA title of the franchise, it's odd how it achieves that despite being the first one eliminated from the list. The smaller areas definitely contributed to that, but this is a very fun game on the go, and I'm sad to see it finally come to an end. Now this one is a big hitter for me due to sentimental memories, given it's one of the only images I had of the game from watching cousins play it at a really young age. So returning to Peacekeepers always puts a smile on my face. The canyon area is one of the first instances of enemies actually engaging Spyro in combat, the cheeky fuckers. While quite wide and open, there are a few little nooks and crannies to explore with the stark contrast from the very peaceful and bright homeworld prior creating a feeling that Spyro is officially out on his own for this adventure and no longer in the comfort of safety. Granted, there is a lot of comfort to be found in the bright and cheery visuals we've come to love about the different realms in Spyro, and that is especially true for Sunrise Spring. We've got a nice safe space to familiarise ourselves with the purple dragon, meet new friends and begin hunting for eggs in every place imaginable. The caves and lakes terraform the map with lots to see, making this a great entry point. Towards the rear of this place is the gateway to Mushroom Speedway. As another intro course, it gets the job done. The figure eight through tunnels and past the giant shrooms is a cool visual, but these giant killer butterflies unravel a deeper horror theme if you ask me. 
Flying around and shooting shit with Hunter is truly horrific though, because the moment this minigame begins, you're blown to absolute shit. Like, Jesus dude, chill. Baby's barely even figured out how to make Spyro walk at this point. It's just a total slaughter from start to finish. Metro Speedway is much more detailed with large buildings that open into canals and bridges with those iconic towers out over the ocean covered in bungee jumpers. The challenge flying around collecting money the thieves drop behind Hunter is actually tolerable for a change and I just love the visuals of this scale model metropolis. Ocean Speedway is incredibly similar in terms of quality, so let's just smash that one out too while we're at it. The name Speedway has never been more accurate with cars and boats racing all over the place, and it's another fine example of why there is so much to love about this kind of level. The first time I actually explored around as a kid and discovered a new mission really opened my eyes at such an impressionable age to what helps make levels in games feel populated and realistic for lack of a better turn. We all know by this point that most of Spyro 1's bosses blow pretty hard, but blow hard, despite the battle itself being just as forgettable as the rest, takes place in what I'd consider one of the most memorable areas of the game. I'm talking of course about the interior section with water caves beneath platforms being contorted by the sorcerers of this land. And with that slapping beat banging in our ears, it's a damn shame these didn't reach all of their potential because I would have loved to have seen an extended version. Dawn of the Dragon is still hanging in there with the Ruins of Warfang, in at number 79. I'm surprised it survived this far given my awful first time going through this by myself, so grab yourself a partner and get spelunking through the cavernous architecture, exploring secret chambers, and collecting the four keys to open the passageway for the other dragons. This is a massive location, with different paths branching off leading you to several different sections of combat and challenges which require a little bit of delicate thinking. It can sometimes be easy to miss important details that are crucial to completion based on my experiences, but it's definitely an interesting environment to explore in the game. For many of the same reasons, the catacombs where Spyro and Cinder awaken from a deep slumber is also interesting to explore, but first you need to destroy this giant monster in a heart jolting battle so early on. Learning combat along with the intricacies of the duo's movement and abilities comes quite naturally as we fight our way through to escape, platforming and climbing vines in this tranquil part of the level filled with giant structures before one last encounter with the beast ends off an excellent first chapter of the game. A Hero's Tale begins in the Dragon Village, and wow, look at how vibrant everything is. This may just be the best looking place in the entire game. Which is sad, because it's all downhill from here. It's a simple linear course for the introduction, with an emphasis on platforming and fighting off the returning Norks. It's all so bouncy and sweet, it gets you pumped up to dive into things playing through. Shame it's all over with so quickly. Time for Dino Mines. Set in the Wild West with gunslingers and the like raining down a hellfire of bullets in your direction. The various buildings that make up the ghost towns offer up a level that feels like there is a lot going on, and I really like the flooded mine shaft littered with dynamite in your way. It doesn't look all that great, but the music is good no matter which region you're in, but that's where it ends for this one due to the abysmal selection of side challenges. Storming the tunnel to find an egg is passable, I guess, but the shooting gallery with Agent 9 is one of the most fuckest things in the entire game. It's a shit show, and what's worse is the boring slog backtracking back through for all of the collectibles when everyone is dead. It's so boring. I wish we'd seen better from this one. A weak level to end off the final realm of the third installment, Midnight Mountain. In fact, there are a lot of levels here that tend to be big discussion points for heated debate among fans, I'm sure. But the map itself is very pretty with the night colours and features several cool landmarks that surround the castle centre. There is plenty to find if you explore too, and finally getting to lay hands on that gem-hungry bear makes this a reasonably satisfying end to the game. 
The Hub World Prior, Evening Lake, is also a strong one and is unique for being the only Hub World with such a large water presence to dive through. Just the glowing orange castle sitting above the glistening reflections of the lake is a sight to behold, along with all of the other special moments to discover deep down below. The giant whale, shipwrecks and secret rooms, and it's so cool that we also get to climb the cliffside to the very top for an epic view of the epic environment down below. Alright, it's time to finally knock out both of the remaining Game Boy Advance titles, but we've still got a few levels for each to get through, so let's get started with the Mermaid Coast from Season of Ice. While somewhat barren of detail and easy to accidentally fall into the water, searching for lighthouses to turn on and just running around the pretty coastline is enough to carry this one through to being a solid world for the platform. Right after this is Lava Prairie, which has these annoying pterodactyls we need to knock out of the sky by painfully nudging these spiked blocks over towards the geysers in order to knock them out. But aside from that, it's another decent one with good visuals and a great bit of music to accompany it. Plus, I like all of the bones scattered everywhere. It's a nice touch. Listen, I like skulls, okay? Leave me alone. Country Farms from Season of Flame offers up peaceful fields and paddocks that are a great opening as Spyro regains the ability to breathe fire and kill wizards. Come on, you've never seen a farm wizard before? Otherwise, this course is very good but still very basic, much like all of these. That doesn't mean that they're bad, just a simplified bite-sized version of the classic games in the series. Another level from Flame is Haunted Hills. Now this is damn cool. It's a haunted graveyard filled with all manner of ghouls and ghosts, bitches on broomsticks and jack-o'-lanterns everywhere. Visually amazing for a Halloween themed environment and the music just completes it so well. We meet Yorick, the skull dude, now come on you know I like skulls, and this little friend is just adorable. The entire aesthetic and design of this one is truly a top tier for the games on this system, making these next few choices very difficult. In at the coveted 69 spot is Panda Gardens, another level from Ice which is, at its core, a poor man's bamboo terrace. It even has that annoying mystery bottle which, Jesus, good luck with that given this level has very few landmarks to go off of. But despite that, it's without a doubt one of the prettiest levels on the GBA and it even includes some more open areas instead of following such a linear design as other worlds we've seen so far. Very good, but not as good as the next one. The final level from Season of Ice, Roman City. Taking inspiration from Sunny Villa, I love the sharp colours here and overall, it feels like you're playing a classic Spyro game with this one. Those annoying off-screen rocket enemies from Hummingbird 4 to back, which does hurt this one in the rankings, but what a level to complete Season of Ice's run through this list in what was an incredible effort after a dire beginning. Good stuff. And now, the final level from Season of Flame goes to Tiki Tropics. A similar looking realm as the previous, surrounded by water that needs to be frozen over in order to reach certain objectives, but also filled with gnarly brambles that need burning away in order for us to reach the Great Pyramids and reignite the various idols in the land. Incredibly fun, incredibly memorable for this game in my opinion, another game from the franchise that had a decent offering despite its limitations, which is a trait that I always love to see. Now that all of the portable games have been officially eliminated and are out of the way, we can finally start to chew on the real meat of this franchise, and oh boy, I'm just so excited. A Hero's Tale, Dawn of the Dragon, and surprisingly Enter the Dragonfly are still in the race as well. So let's get down to the nitty gritty and start knocking out some strong contenders. <laughs> 
Okay, never mind. I feel viscerally sick for following up the words strong contender with Cloud9 from Enter the Dragonfly. But by process of elimination, shockingly, this level I once considered to be completely abysmal features some decent qualities. For starters, the music and general atmosphere is incredibly chill as a nice sampler of the vibes we can expect from the franchise. Layout wise, it's passable. There are some weird areas, but despite its gargantuan size, I find the vertical segments to be kinda memorable. I really just wish that it wasn't such a heaping slog to navigate through. Instead of an instantly classic skybox to marvel at, we're surrounded by fuzzy pink bum fluff clouds that box the stage in, and your reward for reaching the end is a terrible, terrible flying section defending the puffy palace. I'm shocked to be admitting it's one of the better realms of the game, but this high up for the entire series is a true testament to Spyro's rapid downfall. Cloud9 is basically a bootleg clone of former worlds in the same way that Dragonfly Dojo is just the dumping ground for what a computer AI thinks Spyro games are. Asian temples shrouded in fog, zen-like whistles and chants to the soundtrack, monk bags who just kinda exists here, and of course, armoured tank combat, Spyro's most famous selling point. The main level itself is actually fine enough though, I honestly believe that. Looking past the lack of polish that taints this entire game, the Serene Mountain Dojo features several landmark areas and acts as a solid introductory level to catch players up to speed. Could have done without the crystallized dragons reference, haha <laughs> get it? But all in all, it's okay. The aptly named Dry Canyon from the original game couldn't be more accurate of a title, as the barren landscape is dry of any memorability. With nothing strikingly bad, but also nothing strikingly impressive, I find this one tends to just come and go. The only real noteworthy points are some of the larger structures we climb and glide towards. This one is just kind of present in the game, and that's fine with me, because at the end of the day, aren't we all just looking for a pleasant little collectathon romp, a goal that Dry Canyon achieves reasonably well. Terrace Village does a better job of setting itself apart, with more striking visuals and a better soundtrack, a strong layout that encourages exploration through huts, open swampy plains and climbing fortified structures. Gliding across the rooftops is surely the most memorable aspect, alongside the glowing hum of those electrified plates all over the place. One of the levels considerably enhanced by the Reignited trilogy with a gorgeous modernization of the swamp visuals, which truly captures what I remember seeing through my childhood eyes. Then, in what feels like an extension of Terrace Village, the homeworld foe Metalhead is up next, with the best boss level of the original game. We get to explore the courtyard area of his armoured fort, and I'm glad, as there are lots of corners to creep into for hidden treasures around this place. The soundtrack of Beastmakers continues to impress, with a less memorable I'd suggest, but still excellent piece of music as we enter the interior to face off against the Metallic Menace. A simple battle destroying his defences rather than going toe-to-toe -to -toe directly, the second phase opens up the level with additional caves and ledges to reach, as the first adventure peaks and remains on that high for the rest of the game. Now we really are starting to knock out some strong contenders, but be prepared to hate me because in at 61, we have Luau Island, the final entry from Enter the Dragonfly. Oh dear, I cannot wait to hear the comments on this one. How is this above any Spyro 1 level? Well, allow me to inform you. Had we seen any regard for consistent quality in Enter the Dragonfly, Luau Island had the potential to be the best level in the entire game, but what we ultimately got is still the best thing this game has going for it, and I'm prepared to die on this hill, but I personally get more enjoyment replaying this level than the recent eliminations from the original game. Why? 
because this is a fun course. It's constantly changing from land gameplay, taking out enemies, crashing into the water and diving for gems, before we resurface through a tunnel and begin climbing the cliffside pathways. There is a lot going on here. It's upbeat and animated, with plenty of areas to explore, and while far from perfect, both the Tiki Drums and Manta Ray Challenges are incredibly tolerable by this game's standards. Sure, there may be better beach levels out there with more polish and less accidentally glitching into the floor and escaping reality, but at the end of the day, it's a fun one to play through. What more can I possibly say to defend it before the Spyro Opinion Police start knocking on my door? Up next is Sunny Beach. It's quite clear there was some inspiration stolen from this one when Luau Island was being made, given the regular switching between land and underwater gameplay is so similar. Though I feel Luau Island did it far better, fight me, Sunny Beach is far more concise and to the point, so it doesn't hang around long enough for you to get sick of it. It doesn't do the beach theme as well in my opinion, but it's more polished overall, so these are really incredibly close to each other in the rankings. Shame to see the Turtle Chef nerfed in Reignited though, a real blow to this map overall, but it swings back with a banging tune that's without question some of Copeland's finest work on the trilogy. They pay me for this. Uh. Wild Flight is the superior speedway from the original game, without a doubt. Featuring this absolute slapper and enemy pathways that overlap, forcing the player to tune in their ability to multitask in order to complete this course within the time limit. I love the rivers and lakes that snake around, and then going through into this area to capture the final objectives. There is only one speedway that did it better than Wild Flight. Can you guess what it is? We've got a feast of Spyro 3 worlds coming up right now, so prepare yourself for shock and awe. The first is Haunted Tomb, a decent realm of Midnight Mountain, but made overly tedious due to certain enemies and hazards that require special attacks in order to destroy. Beyond that though, this place is littered with set pieces, falling rocks, the giant snake at the center, and the cute little doggos and their trivia about bandicoots. Agent 9 makes an appearance to dispatch a large horde of enemies, but most infamously, this bastard tank demolition derby is also present. Thank God they made this easier in Reignited, because it's the cause of far too much trauma. With these patches, it's good to see Haunted Tomb a little higher in the rankings than I initially expected. Up next is Sheila's Alp, which is a much shorter, albeit the best level dedicated to an alternate character in the game. The mountainous terrain gives perfect opportunity for the kangaroo's moveset to thrive, with a mixture of caves to traverse along the way, helping out all the little billy goat bros. And even though we get sick of hearing it every time Sheila appears in later stages, she certainly has a very nice bit of theme music. Not much else to really say on this one, as it's just a solid map to hop through. Detouring for a moment to Zephyr from Spyro 2. I'm sure this one is up for much debate among fans. The military theme does hurt it as the little worm dudes defend their paddocks from breeze builder attacks, but the heavy artillery and dynamite don't detract from what's generally a fun map to explore through caverns and along fortified walkways high above what is such a greater expanse to discover. Of course, herding the cowlicks back to their pen is as triggering as the day I first played it as a kid but playing with the professor's magic beans to climb the tower puzzle is a neat side challenge to rescue darling Juliet. I feel like I'm starting to mention it almost every single level as of late, but the music here, again, is really good. I love it. Spyro 2 showing why it's such a banger to play through to this day. Back to Year of the Dragon with another Midnight Mountain entry, the Crystal Islands. Across these shattered lands, we'll uncover magic, wonder, and a slew of cool areas. 
Flying above, chasing thieves and reaching the top of a castle to find an egg is fun, and the large slide slips Spyro into more treasure than ever. Bentley's Whack-A-Mole does hurt it though, especially the butchered reignited version where you can't see a damn thing, but the rest of Crystal Islands is a treat, aside from the music that was featured in the US version. That shit can die in a fire, because whatever animal Copeland burned in a fire to create the soundtrack is absolutely hideous and ruins an otherwise superb tune. And speaking of music, Lost Fleet is another that had a significant shakeup between regions. While the US got more of Sheila's Alp in this stage, PAL region players got the much more fitting super bonus round theme. But given the recent discoveries of pre-release versions of Spyro 3, I must point out, the unused music for Lost Fleet featured in the April 25th prototype is an original tune that is a true work of art. It combines the chilling and mysterious shipwreck atmosphere with a banging guitar piece. I highly recommend seeking it out for yourself. As for the actual level though, I must admit, I've never been a fan. For a coastal level, it doesn't achieve that look too well, though I do enjoy all of the little coves and sandbars that trap these forgotten wrecks that we get to explore. Big points for the portal inside of a giant shark skull, thank you. Swimming around is cool too, but the submarine area can often prove more annoying than enjoyable in my experience, though I find it hard to argue against the skateboard races with Hunter. Yes, I am being impartial because I'm not overly keen on the skating minigames here, but this one is okay. With a decent layout and balanced challenge in my opinion, Lost Fleet overall is strong, but we're still a little way off from seeing the absolute platinum tier levels. Town Square is usually a peaceful place when raging bulls aren't charging through the streets and egg thieves aren't running amok. This is a very simple course, gliding between buildings and plazas with fountains coated in a golden sunset. Everyone knows this level and I'm sure everyone loves it. The real crime is how small it is, yet I'm impressed by how much Insomniac was able to cram into here with the higher section that borders the main area as a cherry on top. Back outside in the artisan homeworld is our introduction to the purple dragon, with grassy plains overflowing with norks and fodder to flame, tunnels leading towards towers, waterfalls with hidden secrets, and a hedge maze that my seven year old memory had me thinking was as big as this entire map. It's such a gem running around here so fluently whenever you choose to start a new adventure. I couldn't think of a more inviting, bubbly location to kickstart this franchise and it's always sad heading to the balloonist when it's time to leave. But before we go, we need to drop in and visit Stone Hill which really goes hand in hand with the artisan home, featuring a grassy courtyard and castle overlooking the stunning Oceanside area. It's a basic level to navigate but still offers its fair share of special set pieces sprinkled throughout, from the beach caves where we find a key, all the way down the well to find a treasure chest, then darting out across the open terrain, charging bad guys and chasing down another thief across the expansive knolls, we have these early levels to thank for all of the adventures yet to be had in Spyro's future. Alright people, it's time for the top 50 Spyro levels, and we're gonna kick things off with the final Speedway course. We've seen many stinkers and many quality tracks throughout the rankings, but no Speedway did it better than Country Speedway in Year of the Dragon. Yeah, with its tried and true theme, solid structure and the least offensive Hunter minigame, how can you go wrong with some country fun? It's got a good mix of aerial and land based objectives spread across the warm environment and the race course is an absolute barnstormer, darting in and out of all of the obstacles with plenty of wide open fields to swoop across as well. I'm confident in claiming this as the peak Speedway experience given it achieves such incredible quality in every aspect one of these maps should strive for. A stunning level to kick off our top 50. Sticking with the country theme, Robotica Farms is in at number 49. The stables, fields and mills have been invaded by bug bots, so now we've got to roam all over the land doing some bug extermination. And you know what? 
It's a lot of fun. What feels like one of the larger worlds of Spyro 2, there is a lot to see with the various landmarks, and despite the size of it, it achieves that good, hearty, dynamic feeling with just how well populated everything is. There is the Scarecrow thing, which can be a pain in the ass at times, but reaching the end, this level continues to expand even further with the supercharged track up above the entire thing. A detail you wouldn't even notice your first time on the farm, really helping to create that amazing feeling that these are real, fleshed out locations with plenty to discover. All in all, happy to finally see this one appear. At this point, a Hero's Tale is only hanging on by a thread now that Coastal Remains is up for discussion. This place is huge, with so many different areas to see. Several coves, each with their own mysteries to unlock, various cave tunnels, secret pools and waterfalls, cliff sides, and new challenges to conquer repeatedly. In some ways, it's almost too big, especially for a hub location. This is essentially two levels worth of content throughout this great expanse, which has actually helped it stick around for a high position on the list. For a coastal area, the vast majority lacks actual coastline, but what we do have is a lively tropical tune and the friendly locals to keep us company, like this otter dude. Jack really likes otters. Some of the platform challenges can be finished for a lack of satisfying rewards, but it's hard to dispute such an impressive amount of content within a single location. The Legend of Spyro is another contender we haven't seen for some time, as the duo destroy the dam, flooding the land and capturing the Colossus Destroyer. Now there is only one thing left to do. Destroy the damn thing! This feels so epic, managing to teach games of a modern era how to be cinematic through the use of set pieces and actual gameplay. We have to fly around destroying the dark power crystals, opening up a new section each time we do it. It's another rush of enemies, but at least this time, it all feels like a step toward achieving a more ultimate goal as we scale this giant beast right up to the very top. Some of these segments are awkward to figure out, but reaching the summit and then eventually travelling inside to the core and attacking its heart directly is truly historic. Then it's just the rapid escape through the erupting tunnels back out to safety as the creature is finally destroyed. Not before igniting a fire that burns the entire land of all life. What a moment in time only the truly exceptional levels could surpass. Now that we've made it so far into this video, again, please remember to stand up and have a nice stretch, refill your snacks, and please go to the toilet. Then come back and get comfy, because the top 50 has already proven full of quality worlds, each more memorable than the last. But which levels upcoming will be eliminated, and which will survive on the road towards the top 10? Well, you'll just have to keep watching and find out, won't you? I mean, you've already made it this far. What's another hour of your day wasted listening to my bullshit as we move on to number 46? It's time to explore the pure majesty of Autumn Plains, and what a strong homeworld this one is. With its grassy poolside garden, marble glazed hallways inside the castle, and a monumental glide from atop a tower out to a mysterious island for a prize. This entire place just screams bliss as we explore every inch of it for orbs and other treasures. Spyro learns to climb here, making this a significant turning point for level structure moving forward, and the angelic chimes send chills of zen down your spine as you select from a dominant list of new realms to explore. One of these is Magma Cone, a scorched land under attack by rock golems and surrounded by a great volcano which is host to only the hottest parties. Outside we have a slew of traps to lure in unsuspecting monsters. There's ledges to climb, ladders and an icy cave filled with crystal popcorn. This challenge is not that difficult, guys. Chill out already. Ultimately, the goal is to reach the volcano interior, seal off the hatch, and then fly around eliminating the remaining lava monsters infesting the place. The level as a whole has got a lot going on, with surprising attention to variety with locations and gameplay styles, which really cements why this formula works so well. Diving into another level from 3, Seashell Shore is up next with its mixture of swimming and land-based gameplay, teaching both Sunny Beach and Luau Island how it's done. 
Despite the coastal theme, there is an abundance of pink tones which creates something of a dreamlike sensation. A detail reignited failed to capture, opting for a more traditional beachy visual that ultimately resulted in the colour palette here feeling far more flat and dull. The music is still good though, and once again Insomniac put work into offering variety. On top of the different terrains Spyro needs to navigate, Sheila shows up to destroy a giant sandcastle, there are strong currents to navigate for the reward of a dragon egg, and the mini boss against Bluto the shark is in all honesty a decent side area for what it is, and very memorable. Crocoville Swamp from the opening of A Hero's Tale offers a lot more than you would expect at first glance. With vast marshes, crumbling temples and caves to explore, this is another one that can sometimes be difficult to digest the true scope of it. Despite the theme, visuals remain nice and vibrant which is appreciated and the soundtrack combines natural sounds with the use of drums, a didgeridoo and even a choir to create a very peaceful atmosphere despite all the things trying to kill us. Spikes jabbing out, vines and ferocious fauna all stand in our way. So as an introduction to this particular story, this is a great launching pad. By Spyro 2 standards, I would say that Cloud Temples is just more of the same by the time you reach it inside of Winter Tundra. But goddamn, this game is so good that average by its standard still completely rocks the 146 levels that have come before it. So yeah, this one is good. We start our defensive mission against the Warlocks by climbing up through the dojo and out into the primary courtyard overrun by horny mountain goats. The bell tower climb is a well done vertical platforming segment and tracking down Agent Zero to his secret base can still prove a little challenging but a fun distraction nonetheless. Although nothing will distract from the egregious mess they made of his face in the remake. Poor little fella, his face is fucked. It's a level with few significant talking points but one that I always enjoy running through whenever I revisit the game. From the clouds back down to earth and the big city of Metropolis, populated by these clank looking robots. Coincidence? Yeah, probably. Personally not overly big on this one given it's mostly narrow hallways inside of the buildings, doesn't really give off a big city vibe if you know what I mean. Especially with the ox just roaming around the ice rink in the middle. Bastard ox. But breaking free out into the open dome with Avalar's first double power up and flying around destroying UFOs is more what I'm looking for. This is another level where I don't have a whole lot to say beyond it being an indisputably well put together stage with fun gameplay and a good sense of humour. As we creep closer and closer to those premium tier positions, it's gonna get real tough real quick here people. Alpine Ridge was always a level I always felt was kind of forgettable with the washed out colours and given it's so brief, it never stuck in my head. That was until I played Toys for Bob's recreation and yeah, I can see now why this map has scored such a high ranking. It's got all of the beloved tropes of the formula, wide glides, terrain that is interesting to navigate with the sheltered gorges and some of the most fun enemies of the game. The wizards blocking your path and conjuring spells is a key detail of Magic Crafters levels and the beefy boys who ram into you are just rad in my opinion. A great little slice of expert level design right here. After navigating the catacombs following a deep slumber, Spyro and Cinder fly out into the fresh night breeze from atop Twilight Falls for a stunning view and then a gentle rest down by the river, which is rudely interrupted before too long. This forest coated in the moon's glow is pure enchantment just wandering around and exploring, navigating back up some of the waterfalls and climbing cliff faces to progress. When not hyper focused on combat, the soundtrack in Dawn of the Dragon is so elegant and it's no different here. What an absolute crime we're only present for such a short amount of time because I am rabid for more of this calming, meditative exploration through such a majestic landscape. In similar fashion, Dark Hollow from the original game found at the back of the hedge maze in the Artisan Homeworld is also a magnificent nighttime affair spoiled by being so inexcusably short. The warm glows flood the cool environment with a sense of safety, especially with the updated graphics which is accompanied by a harmonious blend of light chimes and deep bass to create an overall stunning atmosphere. 
Also, props to whoever made the decision to reimagine the underground section as a dragon library, because it's a detail that I think we can all agree fits perfectly. For such a teensy tiny map, it's got just the right amount of exploration, enemies and treasure to unlock, but yeah, I'm absolutely torn that I couldn't place it any higher than this. Later on in the game is the much more fleshed out Lofty Castle, which is an impressive offering by the standards of the first title. Lots of floating islands to traverse which surround these great castle structures, each with their own new challenges. I just like the idea that these balloon guys have been waiting patiently here for the entire game just for Spyro to come along and bop them out of existence. Supercharge ramps, fairy whirlwinds and that classic magical art direction, it's a great showing for the first game as we still have many of these worlds left to get through. Bamboo Terrace from Year of the Dragon is another that had the potential to appear even higher, though an elimination at 36 is nothing to undersell because this is great. Highly memorable with a simple structure and fun theme, the on-rails shooter thing protecting the pandas offers some challenge while climbing the temple with Bentley is the best thing he does for the entire game. So good stuff. It's an overall very well executed stage that shows how some of the more basic level layouts can still provide a lot of entertainment in comparison. From Asia to the Middle East with one of my absolute favourites, that being Scorch from Ripto's Rage. A level struck with some slight controversy and debate with Reignited, but forget all of that. I just think it's a banger map with whopper tunes and I can't help but whistle along while I play. The two-legged camels are funky and charging down the flag keeper introduces some much needed challenge at this point in the adventure. As a kid, I was missing an orb here for years until it finally dawned on me that I'd somehow completely missed Hunter's monkey catching arena. Yeah, I didn't miss much, but whatever. It's passable, I suppose. Scorch could have hit the top 10 for me personally without a second thought, but being as impartial as humanly possible, I feel like Reignited was a serious downgrade all around, given the modern artistic vision failed to capture the same level of charm the original had to offer. So I'm admittedly kind of sad to see this one knocked out right now. Downstairs from Scorch, you'll enter Fracture Hills, which takes the linear formula to perfected and opens things up to a simple ridge overlooking the fiery crater below with that stone temple perched up as the centerpiece. As the bagpipes boom across the land with each new satyr you rescue, it creates a very distinct memory in your brain that's hard to break free from, especially once you return with the headbash ability to help the alchemist reach Hunter and then the two of you go on an Earth Shaper killing spree. Oh, what fun. Topped off with the extended supercharge through all of the tunnels and over bridges, the more open design worked an absolute treat on this one to help create something that stands out from the pack. Okay, it's time to give another game the KO. The final level from A Hero's Tale we have to discuss is Dragonfly Falls. Of course it is. Most of you probably saw that one coming, which says more than I ever could about how pleasant this one is to play through. Navigating the narrow cliffs overflowing with grass and vines above the rivers and lakes below creates such a relaxing setting thanks to the addition of a very calming tune. For a larger environment, there are also so many significant landmarks with a selection of waterfalls and caves to explore. Some larger areas can feel a little underwhelming, but for the most part, the scale doesn't impact the overall quality. As you explore deeper, the more things continue to open up until you finally reach the expansive coastline. It's just so lovely. Hunter is back again, our first time truly playing as the character, sniping bad guys with his bow and climbing around a chasm towards the back in search of rewards. A Hero's Tale struggled significantly in the ranking with a large chunk of unpolished, generic and slapped together levels. Hell, it even started this entire ranking with those putrid Blink the Mole stages. But to see the quality that it still had to offer soar so high gives me a nice fuzzy feeling inside. Though now that it's eliminated, we only have four more games left as we climb closer and closer to the absolute best.
It's almost shocking to think that a hub area could perform so well, but that's just a testament to Magic Crafters. Without a doubt the best realm from the first game, this may as well be classed as an actual level. Those wizards are all over the place stirring up trouble, in the gardens, hallways and by the pools, but this is where Spyro learns the famous supercharge and finally gets to teach those guys a lesson. Every challenge it offers is so memorable, with two egg thieves to chase down, on top of several cool areas to explore in this sensational mountain landscape that has aged like a fine wine. Snow coated and allowing us to access some of the best levels the franchise ever saw, as well as giving us our first ever glimpse of our hero. I hope you can all agree with me on this one, Magic Crafters is an absolute gem. Heading over to Haunted Towers now, and just look at that skybox. How rad is that? Running around collecting fairy kisses and blasting super bad guys has never been more fun in the shadow of this great castle in the sky. This is a level that evolved our puzzle solving instincts and taught us how to use that supercharge to its fullest potential in accessing every area in this tower. So many different rooms, each with a new fun discovery, and the courtyard towards the rear jam packed with foes to battle. Bloody excellent. This is a testament to why we're all so keen on a new Spyro adventure over 20 years later. From towers of a haunted nature to the enchanted towers spiraling into Spyro 3's horizon. Oh boy, there is a lot to break down here. It's one of the most epic levels of the entire trilogy, in all honesty, given there is so much to see. From the main path through the giant structures that lead around the corner to some new pastures, here we can enter into a skateboard competition against Hunter, popping off 900s like a pair of gnarly norks. Continuing further towards the back, we have to help the lost little puppy get back to his owner through a brief puzzle segment, and then finally, Sergeant Bird adopts an air approach to the level which blows my mind. This is how you implement new characters, allow them to traverse the same levels as your main protagonist so that you can unlock a wider potential for challenges within those locations. Even though the bird can be questionable to control at times, this just elevates the entire experience, separating it from the pack for something truly unique within the franchise. There is nothing else like it. Nothing. So, Enchanted Towers is well deserving of the award for most innovative variety. Cloud Spires, also from the third game, is another exceptional world with little to argue against. A fun floaty theme that shows Cloud9 how to do it properly, with several great glides and lots of different areas to explore. Take the track around the back and light up the bellows, or climb around and up on top of the level to get a good look at everything as you glide towards a hard to reach egg. Inside we run down the sun seeds to light up the world, and back outside above the clouds the bell towers are activated to cheer up this happy little rain cloud. Lots of personality in this one that is always a treat to run through. Charmed Ridge on the other hand, hmm, you know it's taken some serious convincing from my advisors who helped me to rank a large chunk of this list to place this one so high, but you know what, I think I finally get it. Personally, I was never too keen on Year of the Dragon to begin with, but I can appreciate seeing some Magic Crafters inspired hazards and enemies present here. The level itself is structured very well with a nice theme and music to complement it, with caves and precarious platforms all over the place. While I do prefer the seed challenge in Zephyr, Jack's Beanstalk Climb is still a welcome addition to introduce some challenge, but if you want challenge, well the big bird has you covered once again in this three-waved attack which was thankfully for my sanity made a bit less chaotic in the remake. So yeah, I've had my mind changed on this one. While I still kind of groan to see it so high, I can be impartial enough to see what all of the hype is about. Charmed Ridge is an incredibly solid level. Moving over to Idle Springs now, where the sentient tikis are on a rampage and we have to stop them. A much more linear course through the snaking pathways leading from the lake out front, by rivers and under natural canopies leading up to a temple waterfall. Supercharging hula girls to safety is one of Jack's favourite pastimes, and climbing along all of the structures helps this level get the absolute most out of the space, not wasting a single inch. Taking a dive to discover a hidden room with a new challenge is also a good introduction to Spyro 2's excellent side missions, feeding the giant idol some yummy 
fish. A warm and comforting welcome to Summer Forest. Speaking of, Summer Forest makes it all the way to number 26 in the rankings as the definitive homeworld of the entire franchise. A mesmerizing sight to behold as you explore the gardens and stunning architecture here with greenhouses, pools for swimming inside of the castle and lots of hidden platforms to reach for an awe. This place is gorgeous and almost dreamlike with that meditative soundtrack. It's already so difficult to select a new level as they're all exquisite in this area, but I can't even bring myself to leave due to how mellow these vibes are. I could just sit here and tune out the world because this part of Avalar is my ultimate happy place. That last statement couldn't have been any more true for the Valley of Avalar, the last remaining level we have from Dawn of the Dragon, and my my, what a monumental end. For a game that started out in the ranks incredibly early on, it's been a long journey to reach such a high ranking position, but man, it certainly deserves it. After defending the Cheetah Village from an attack, Spyro and Cinder venture out into the meadows, split by a river of rapids, filled with trees and rocky structures to explore, waterfalls and caves, all isolated by great mountains along the border, the absolute majesty flying through nature as it blooms to this incredible soundtrack track. Where do you even begin? There is so much to be done here. Finding a lost friend of the village is a start, exploring the treacherous canyons towards the back in search of a mysterious stranger, and meeting an elite boss atop a cliff. This place is overflowing with memorable set pieces and challenge as far as the eye can see, on top of what is already just a stunning level to explore for treasures hidden deep. This is the evolution for Spyro I would love to see, with a greater focus on exploration and problem solving, like how one dragon has to grab onto the raft while another pulls it up the river. Working as a cohesive unit to complete objectives has never been more enjoyable. Truly, the Valley of Avalar is worthy of a strong position at 25, as we finally say goodbye to the final remaining title from the Legends trilogy. It was mostly a rough, rough ride, but it was all worth it just to experience such an unforgettable landmark in the franchise. So, with that elimination, all remaining levels will be from the original trilogy, which means that my job just got significantly more challenging. I mean, it's going to be so, so tough to critique and rank these upcoming stages. Insomniac, Toys for Bob, why did you have to make this so difficult for me? <sighs> okay, we've had a moment. I've certainly had a moment. Remember to like and share the video as the adventure continues into number 24. Spooky Swamp from 3. Gorgeous hum of wildlife lurks under lantern glow. Watch for mosquitoes. Explore along the rivers and treetops for gems. Cute little fireflies speak in hypnotic haiku with money bags too. A sleepy wizard tries to brawl with Spyro here. Not so tough now, huh? And Sheila leads friends through a gauntlet of hazards to rescue an egg. Reckless abandon. What's wrong with these idiots? A bastard to pass. Bop to a great tune. An infectious atmosphere. Spooky Swamp is sweet. So memorable, with much personality. A treat to charge through. Okay, <laughs> thank fuck that's over with. Let's move on. Sunny Villa starts off Year of the Dragon with an exceptionally welcoming stage, brimming with guards in a bright town square. There are buildings to climb, including a giant tower off to the side, glides of great distance, and even a giant chicken. Nothing odd about that. As a level, it is about as bare bones as you can get, but as an introduction, it sets up the game perfectly with the addition of a skateboard arena featuring plenty of rad jumps to practice. It's not always about the complexity of a stage, usually it's just about nailing something simple and making the most out of it. 
Misty Bog is up next. Surprised to see it so high up, given the original version was so murky and spread out, it was always a bit of a mess in my opinion. But thanks to the updated visuals, we can finally get a good look at this place to see how well the plateaus, jetties and temple ruins bleed into each other to create a really natural flow between different sections. I always loved jumping down through a hollowed stump into a cave below the muddy water. That is such a cool set piece. Then re-emerging into those stone structures with the waterfall behind us. Those attack frogs though, my goodness. Sure, just put all of them right here in this narrow room. Don't give me any room to actually navigate while I try to avoid the bastards. Jesus Christ. But other than that, a super duper solid world from the first game, enhanced by modern hardware. High Caves is in a similar position as I prefer to play it in the remake personally. Shit just looks a lot nicer of course, but it's more about the location feeling fully realised after so many years and hitting its ultimate potential. Flying over to the main area is a lot of fun and what you'll find is a series of jumps Spyro needs to make in order to reach all of the different nooks and crannies. Don't worry if you miss a jump though because the helpful fairies will protect you. Egg thieves and spider caves infested with difficult foes and that same great aesthetic you'll find in all Magic Crafters realms. The high caves are an integral element to the success of this adventure. Molten Crater, another strong elimination from Year of the Dragon, is a significantly simpler course featuring no more than a horseshoe design that leads from the exterior and inside to a fiery cave. That's it. Super short, but it has me dying for more. That music is perfect for the occasion and those egg thieves are back again with another supercharge area. This part of the map saw significant changes throughout development, but the final result was spot on. And saving the tiki dudes inside of the lodge with Sergeant Bird is a very well done segment for him, which is pretty rare to see. The most memorable levels from the first title in the series are often the ones which best represent Spyro's achievements in the game design field and what he was known for. Cliff Town is always a prime example of Insomniac's ingenious approach to distance on the horizon and how the game draws greater detail the closer you get to different areas, which created both the distinct visual style of the games as well as creating a template for future gaming generations to perfect with how draw distance is handled. Put on top of that the vibrant red skies and vast open feeling of the desert area with that great vertical structure towards the back for us to climb amidst other more secret discoveries, the legacy of this purple dragon has cemented the value of Cliff Town far beyond what my mere mortal words could ever describe, an elite showcase in game design right here. Now it's time for another personal favourite of mine, Breeze Harbour, where Zephyr's troops have sent a counter-attack on the Breeze Builders. So now the land is infested with blubber firefighters and weird little dudes in buckets of water who are trying to turn off all of the machinery by putting out fires. This is a level where Spyro teaches kids to light fires. Welcome to the top 20, ladies and gentlemen. The course itself is quite simple, with really only a few turrets laid about that we use to destroy all of the mines. But it is quite pretty, more so on the PS1, I would argue. The blues and greens clash with the strong yellows and reds very well. Of course, there is also the trolley, which some of you seem to have a lot of trouble with. I think it's fine enough, although maybe eight-year-old me would have had a different story to tell. I always just felt like this was a prime example of why side challenges and minigames should take place within the actual primary area of a level, as opposed to the separate maps Year of the Dragon would introduce. This just feels a lot more planned and fleshed out in my opinion. Moving on to Twilight Harbor now, the last step on our journey to Nasty Nork is so intimidating, I can't believe it. I'm being shot at with an automatic weapon now, where have all the cute little woodland creatures gone? Combined with that booming soundtrack and intense setting with lots of hot tones, this really achieves that end game feel. I always liked the drawbridge used to access the high up ledges on a building, and even as an adult, there is still some fun challenge to be found here. Quality stuff. 
right before this is Nork Cove. Given both of these go hand in hand, let's just get this one out of the way while we're at it. I actually prefer this level because it feels more spontaneous, like Spyro arrived ahead of the Nork's expectations. So the docks are littered with crates to traverse, boats by the shoreline, and I always enjoyed the tunnel underneath the bay filled with an onslaught of enemies. It's got another excellent booming drum track with Copeland's famous organ, though I prefer the daytime look of the original over the darker visuals present in Reignited. Maybe that's just me though. But nothing is more satisfying than charging a barrel of explosives and setting off a chain reaction. It feels like a good reward worth the effort to finally reach these two brilliant worlds. Alternatively to Crash, Spyro has mostly struggled when it comes to ice-themed locations, but Icy Peak is a prime example not just of an extraordinary snow level, but an extraordinary Spyro level in general, taking every aspect that makes a world exciting and memorable and completely nailing it. One of the things I love about discussing level design is the subtle and easy to understand storytelling through visuals rather than blatant explanation. So seeing the peak of this icy mountain provides the player with a crystal clear objective off in the distance which encourages the adventure. Visiting the various cliffside ledges, caves, tunnels and frozen lakes introduces so much detail into the map which is infested with these TNT dudes chasing us all over. Running down some egg thieves in the supercharged course always proves a challenge in what's a superb side area, while protecting Nancy as she skates around the ice rink is... iconic. Yeah, let's just leave it at that. It's time for a colossal knockout of a contender well worthy of a top 10 position that just barely missed the mark. Colossus, despite its simple nature in the mountainous temples among a harmony of chants, has a lot to offer for such an early game realm. With the combination of interiors, evil spirit hide and seek, and the extensive hockey challenge out the back, there is so much to see and do here. Everything looks so peaceful, and despite the meditative nature of the monks, the mission to find and destroy a hideous yeti is ripe with entertaining banter and personality. What keeps this from a top 10 position? Nothing really. We're just zooming in on that end zone at supercharged speeds with only the most platinum tier levels remaining. It's all fucking excellent at this point, so let's just enjoy our reward for making it this far. Ice Cavern from the first game is another that delivers a truly mesmerizing play. Situated inside the walls of a frosted canyon, the vistas offer views of the immaculate landscape which again sets simple goals for the player to venture forward and track down the treasures hidden within. Stone walkways and slippery caves are what you'll find with Norks all over looking for a snowball fight and crystallized dragons everywhere, no doubt frozen in place by the gorgeous music for the level. The chants and other atmospheric detail help to introduce a sense of population out within the map which helps an otherwise cold, isolated location feel so full of life and wonder. Another Spyro 1 level? God, there won't be any left for the top 10 at this rate. Treetops is a true gem. Emerald green tones glistening under the moonlight as we navigate a complicated layout of gnarled branches and boost pads that send us flying all over the place to reach every new vantage point. With so many splitting paths and hard to reach islands, mastery of the supercharge is essential for this one, treating players with one of the few genuinely challenging worlds of the first game. Seriously, I always get lost here and forget where I need to go, but it's never boring as this often leads to new sights I'd miss the first time passing through. A masterful display of tough but encouraging challenge that inspires you to grow and become better. Now in at number 11, our gateway to the top 10 is Glimmer from Spyro 2. Even as an opening course, there is so much to see here, all across the green pastures of giant gemstones, through the caverns and flying around lighting up rainbow beacons. What better place to meet Spyro's best friends and best villains the franchise ever saw, to the grand welcome of such a bouncy and vibrant world. Iconic soundtrack and highly quotable moments, with scenes that stay with you from childhood until the present day. Yes, it is very easy, of course, 
course it is. But it's simplicity executed to absolute perfection, which in my opinion, there is no better way to begin the best game in the series than with this monumentally memorable introduction. Not only does Glimmer introduce us to the world of Spyro 2 and all of the amazing adventures we have there, but it also introduces us to the top 10. Finally. <laughs> oh boy. Man, for such a monumental task as this one, it honestly doesn't even feel real that we've finally made it here. I've been working on this video for five months now. So thank you all so much for joining me if you've made it this far. I hope it's been fun. We've seen some absolutely disgusting trash levels, but we've also seen some unforgettably iconic classic masterclasses in level design. So no more stalling. I am so proud to present you with the top 10 levels from Spyro the Dragon. Coming in at number 10 is Frozen Altars. The Aztec pyramids and courtyards glossed with snow makes for a great setting to melt killer snowmen. Everywhere you look, the architecture leads to new treasures and the entire thing is an absolute treat to play through. The level introduced the use of an alternate ice breath for the very first time, prior to the gimmick being ran into the ground with every following instalment. It's easy to groan, but at this point in time, and even still, all these years later, it just works so perfectly here. Freezing the more troublesome enemies to get an easier shot at them, and using it in a more puzzle variety as well, freezing characters and other objects to create platforms that expand Spyro's reach above the ground. It was groundbreaking! The damn thing even comes into play later on for a game of cat hockey shooting oversized ice cubes into the goals. The only thing keeping Frozen Altars from a higher score though is that damn yeti boxing. It's terrible, always has been and always will be, but at the same time I'm also torn given it's such a remembered talking point for the level as a whole. There is so much to unpack from a map flooded with a great layout, attention to exploration and a very well executed blend of collectathon and mini game objectives. Moving on now to Crystal Glacier, which can I just point out, I always forget this level even exists, and I don't understand why. Not because it's bad or forgettable, I guess Spyro 2 just has so much goodness that this sleeper hit comes as a total shock appearing in the top 10. But it earns this high rank as the sister world to another we have coming up very soon, sprinkled with snow and a very calming atmosphere with those tingly chimes. Several landmarks include the various huts and the large spider tunnel that serves below the ice shelf with that cool serpent bridge money bags happens to own for some reason. Explore towards the back and you'll come to find a lost leopard looking for some fish and oh isn't he just the cutest thing. Then rallying the troops to break the Sherman out from his icy prison results in a huge climax to this magnificent level. The fireworks factory, I'd say, is hard to argue against being so high on this list. Okay, hold on a minute everybody, don't worry, we will get to that. The colours of dusk that sweep over the cliffs and buildings creates a stunning warm glow as Rhinox all over the land erupt in colourful explosions, and with the help of Greta, these ninjas don't stand a chance. It's a huge map to consume with the vast gardens and huge leaps from cannons required to cross over between different areas. While here, Spyro will need to navigate the interior of the factory, taking out any bad guys who lurk inside, and then move out into the courtyards and tunnels, chasing down and destroying the two dragons who were flying all over the place. But after securing the egg from a disabled rocket is when it's time for Agent 9 to shine. 
This Doom-inspired shooter is bad. Trekking all the way to the back of this maze, spewing with enemies, is a monster task, only met by having to make your way back out. But Fireworks Factory would not have made the top 10 had Toys for Bob not stepped in to greatly improve this section of the map with modern controls. So now that the level has reached its fullest potential, it can finally rest atop the pile at an inspiring number 8. It's getting near impossible to rank one level above another at this point, but Mystic Marsh is our next topic of debate. A tough decision given this is without question a personal favourite of mine. However, I can confidently proclaim that this is also worthy of a 7 spot from an impartial lens as well, given this is an outstanding show from the late game of Spyro 2. A much more open and non-linear course, roaming with wild and rabid shell elephants, angry that the fountain has been mistaken mistakenly switched off. Now all of the critters in the land are out of sorts, pelting objects at us and running off with basil spark plugs, making it a huge effort to restore order to the peaceful land. But that's just the fun of it. There is so much to see and do here, climbing up onto the bridges for a nice view, swimming through underwater tunnels and charging all over the place trading items on a mission to hunt down the professor's pencil. That bubbly tune mixes with the joy of a more free, Spyro 1-esque map making for an incredibly fantastic time. Another personal favourite of mine, I swear I'm trying to show as little bias as possible. Hurricose is just extraordinary proof of why the second game deserves all of the praise. The only other level in the game next to Glimmer that doesn't have a companion world, so it stands out as truly unique. The gloomy, depressing atmosphere and jolting contrast of high voltage electric force fields also helps to remove it from the norm, with such a great threat looming among heavy machinery. Those ugly bastards that steal the power stones really shit me as a kid, and admittedly, still does on a bad day, but there really is no other challenge like it. The best feature of Horikos though is that platforming run that takes place above the entire stage as you climb and glide from cliffs and fans to reach the top of the factory for an orb. Hard to deny, this one set itself apart from the crowd and delivered something vastly different at such a high quality, taking a risk that greatly paid off. In at number 5 is Desert Ruins, the final level we have to showcase from Year of the Dragon. Is this one a hot take? I'm not really sure. I figured if you'd ask anyone what the best level in Spyro 3 was, Desert Ruins might be an afterthought, but let me tell you, when you're looking at every single level and comparing them, at the end of the day, the conclusion that I reached at least is that this genuinely is a fucking phenomenal level worthy of ending off this game for us today. A bright sunny jaunt through the sandy part of town is filled with menacing scorpions and burning plates we need to navigate in order to reach the caves and ultimately locate Titty Raider inside of the tomb. Blatant references that help to make it memorable of course, but beyond that is also a neat side-scrolling area with Sheila that makes perfect use of the character's moveset and serves as another example of something completely different which helps this place stick out from the crowd. Not since a Agent 9 on the GBA have we seen any form of side-scrolling in the franchise, and that was all the way back at number 144. And then diving below to help Hunter with more manta ray business is a treat to collect all of the sunken treasure. Spyro 3 Year of the Dragon is a game of much debate with fans, but I'm sure we can all agree it had a whopper offering in the rankings today, capped off with such a great showcase in level design.
With only the first two games left now, Aquaria Towers places in at fourth, just missing out on a podium position, but holy shit, what a testament to the quality on display here. A water level in the top five? That's sacrilege, dude. Starting off as a land-oriented stage, it slowly evolves into a fully fleshed out underwater realm as we open each new hatch to reflood the tunnels for these thirsty seahorses. That transition is what makes this a one-on-one -on, -one on how water should be implemented into platforming games the right way, working alongside the definitive playstyle while still providing a significant shift into something fresh and new. I'll be as bold to claim this as the best water level ever, at least based on what I've played personally. Maybe one day we'll see another one top it as every level ranked continues into the future, but for now, the blend of linear and open areas of pretty sea life is to die for, filled with fun challenge racing on manta rays that increase the pace. What is it with Hunter and these damn manta rays? He bloody loves the things, huh? The tower challenge where you have to rescue the children at the top from hazards within, and the shark pits infested with metallic munchers, all contribute to a fantastic adventure through the depths, with what is an absolute masterclass in game design from the original team at Insomniac. For your bronze spot in at number 3, we have Dark Passage from the original game, and let me tell you, this one is an epic. Climbing up the midnight caves as the little jesters taunt you with their demonic demon dogs, flame them to illuminate the halls and scare off all the nasty critters lurking within the shadows. Visually, I love this ode to ice caverns structured in a circle around this great chasm. At first the level is seemingly too short, but take a good look around because there is so much more to see yet. The additional hallways lead out into great vistas of lengthy glides and such a larger level than initially anticipated anticipated, which is great news as it means we get to listen to this banging tune for so much longer. At its core, this is still an incredibly simply structured course, but it's the twists and turns through the caves that help it to feel endless and adventurous, which is the Spyro formula at its absolute best. Okay, it's time to knock out another game, people. Level number two is... Gelos Badlands from Spyro 2. Yeah, this one is fucking excellent. Are you at all surprised it ranks so high? While missing out on the top spot, it's well understood that this is the premier realm of the second game. Hell, it even greets us on the title screen. It's that damn good. An image locked into our cherished memories. The harsh landscape of burned and rocky cliffs met with giant skulls and caves is so awesome to run around in. I particularly love the bone platforms near the exit that sit above a pool of scorching lava. The music here is excellent too, so awesome as it just makes you want to dance as Spyro charges all over looking for those golden bones and taking out those pesky lizards. The flame dudes are also fun to charge into as we rescue the locals and yes, even the dinosaur eggs are a lot of fun and injects an otherwise tame level with a spike in difficulty. Toys for Bob also did a great job at reigniting this one in the remake as the level has aged so blissfully into a HD era. A stunning end to Ripto's reign over the rankings, but I'm afraid the top spot goes to the last remaining level of the original game. With both bronze and silver awarded after a mammoth ranking of 187 levels, what could possibly be left to take that top prize? We have ranked every single level here today, and it has been an inspiring journey. So please remember to subscribe if you think I've earned it, and tell your friends what you've witnessed here today, because it is finally time for me to announce the best Spyro level is... The best Spyro level is... We, we can't do the top spot without a drum roll.
can somebody give me a drum roll, please? You, sir, can you give me a drum roll? Excellent. Thanks, mate. All right. The number one spot goes to... Wizard Peak. Yes, that's right. The supreme showcase of Spyro Perfection crafted here defines exactly what makes the character and franchise so great. I couldn't think of a more deserving first place. While the worlds of the first game didn't offer all of the pizzazz of bonus challenges and side mini-games the sequels would introduce, when done right, they didn't need them to stand out. What we've got on display here at its core is fun, inventive gameplay. Across the mountainous region are castles to explore, islands out of reach in the distance, and several supercharged pads to navigate. Similar to treetops, it requires a mastery of the ability to reach those most rewarding areas which encourages a certain level of knowledge and skill which I love to see. Exploring the interiors amongst all of the big and not so big enemies is a treat as well. Those little green wizards mean business most of the time, but further exploration will eventually lead you up on top of the roof of these great structures, amplifying the goosebumps you get playing, because honestly, how fucking cool is this? The epic sights and breathtaking glides never disappoint no matter which version of the game you're playing, thanks to the masterful designs and that cheery soundtrack from Copeland, one that just screams Spyro the Dragon in my opinion. Everything here is perfect. It's got one of the absolute best layouts we've seen for a level in the franchise, killer theme with just the right amount of entertaining frolicking, combined with fair challenge and a strong attention to every attribute that goes towards making an instant classic like this. So after multiple hours, I feel elated to award Wizard Peak with the honour and rank of best Spyro level. Oh boy, what a task that was. Thank you all so much for joining me on this journey through the rise and demise, ranking every level from worst to best in celebration of Spyro the Dragon's amazing history. What a strong mark that little purple boy has had on the industry. I cannot wait to see what the future holds for him. I would like to send out a massive thank you to everyone who helped and supported me on the long road to getting this project completed. Donovania for helping me to play and record all of the footage for these games, Jay for his amazing Copeland remix of my theme song, and Petronius for his help with free cam stuff. Special thanks goes out to everyone who supports the channel on Patreon for allowing me to pursue these bigger projects and focus full time on content creation. I love all of you so, so much. To all of my friends and family for their love and constant guidance, and to my amazing partner who builds me up each and every day, keeps my feet on the ground, and whom is responsible for getting me through all of the bad days when I really wanted to quit on making this video. We got there in the end, babe. I love you. And finally, to all of you who watch this video in its entirety, thank you and congratulations. I bet you're all busting for a piss, so I'll make this brief. If you enjoyed every Spyro level ranked, then please remember to drop a like, subscribe, and share it with your friends and on social media. I'm Square Eye Jack, and I hope you have a great fucking day. Thank you all so much for watching.